morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 374. Am I correct, Mr. Grizzly? Yes. Yes. Of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yay. Thought I'd switch it up a little bit today. There you go. I'm happy. I'm bouncy. I what see this. I Yes, yes, yes. I am your, well, sorry, today recording day is Friday. Thank God I am Friday, May 3rd, 2024. And uh, the sun looks like it is trying to make a peek out through the clouds here. And it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day here at the Beaver Lodge. I am your host, the eager beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver A. And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. I need to write your theme song. (laughs) Sure. Uh, We have our usual Friday morning show uh, where we get to stay with you a little longer than usual. Right, Mr. Grizzly? Yes. All right. So there you go. A big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health today? You're wearing yellow. Yeah, I'm. I'm a little. Uh, I'm very tired. It was a later night than normal. Uh, didn't didn't sleep the best, and uh, just got back from taking out Miss Lola. So I'm a little. Uh, I'm a little. I, I'm all, I'm on my first cup of coffee, is what I am. I, I didn't even fold my cuffs over or put my cufflinks on. I'm completely disheveled this morning. Yeah, we were talking pre-show, and Mr. Grizzly says I'm disheveled, and I'm looking. And I'm like, how can I tell? No cufflinks. Cuff I didn't even fold them over. I'm doing. I'm pitting this. This is Brad Pitt from Ocean's Eleven. He wore French cuff shirts. Never wore cuffs. Never did them up. Never wore links. Left left his cuff links like the left. You know, it's all disheveled and scrunkly. So that's me this morning. You and I can't get my lighting right. I'm just. I'm, I'm just very frustrated at the moment. You will forgive me for my lack of cuff link and bow tie. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I hope so. I just can't. I am quite disheveled this morning. <laughs> it looks like it looks you like I have pancake makeup on. I don't. I just can't seem to get my lighting right this morning for some reason. I don't know what the hell is going on. Let's see if we go, uh, if we go to a wide shot. No, that doesn't make a difference. See, because you have natural lighting, and I'm in a sealed and closed booth, as you know, because you've seen the yes. studio. Yes. And last night we were here when, when we were doing Mademoiselle Fox's show and she had me come in for a little bit. And towards the end of it, it was like, okay, I got to get out of here. I'm melting because there's no air in here. I mean, no oh. air flow. Okay. Um, and I'm work. it's part of the design. I'm working on it. I've got a plan in place, but it's, you know, all things take time because they all cost money. And I just don't have an abundance of that particular product. So <laughs> uh, hopefully... Before the super hot weather gets here, I'll be able to get a ventilation shaft in 
place to get some cool air coming from under the desk. And the reason I'll have it under the desk is so that it won't affect the audio, right? Right. Right, indeed. Yep, I hear that. Yep. Uh, yeah, over here, uh, natural sunlight, because I'm actually facing window, and I usually have yes. the curtain pulled a little bit. Uh, and I was trying to open it because it, it gets a little dark here, too, now that we have, mm. like, this and behind me, right? So, right. like, there's, there's, you know, show you, showing you how the sausage is made here. Um, it's a green screen. <laughs> yes. The background kind of moves. So, um, uh, yeah, as I said, but, it's, but it's really close, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm also sort of like, you know, this this room is sort of like closed in, so it gets kind of dark. So, I'm opening it. But over the last couple of days, I noticed there was like this big white thing on the top. And I'm like thinking, like, what the hell? Because if you've seen me disappear off camera, if you've been watching the last couple of days every now and then, and then reappear like a couple of seconds later, it's me trying to adjust the, you know, I f it took me one day to figure out it was the drape. Because the right. first day I was playing with all the uh, the bleeds and whatnot to see what was happening. It's like, why was this? Because it was all in the corner, just in a mm -hmm. corner. Like, that's something. What's going on? Like this. And then the next day it was like right in the middle and it had a weird shape. And then I'm thinking, and that's when I figured out, oh, it's like light actually coming from the window because it's yes. moving. Because yes. we didn't have that problem during the winter. <laughs> no, didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I'm <laughs> I'm allegedly cute and I'm a little slow, but eventually I get there. <laughs> uh, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, all right. Um there's more news uh, here at the Beaver Lodge, by the way, for those who have been following uh, the the Twitter feed. Uh maybe we'll get to talk about it a little later, but uh we're finally Finally, finally, the renovations, because, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I said it was renovation day and I was very happy and renovation day lasted all of about like 30 minutes when they pulled off a couple of things and saw the asbestos. <laughs> so now the asbestos is gone. Uh, and we saw that our house was actually uh, the strawberry box house. When you see it, it was actually like very, very well done. Mm -hmm. like said, the wood actually was like wood underneath and that actually looked kind of nice we like that color so gee why can't we get that color of siding because <laughs> it'll just look really homey and cottagey right. um which is what you really want to go for right you want you want yeah. it to look welcoming yeah exactly uh but uh it uh, took them two days two mm. days that's it to put out all the strapping and all the stuff all the in foam insulation all around yeah Two days. And do that pretty quickly. Yeah. So it went like from the being the house that was like naked on the street and all the other houses are pointing at it and saying, girl, put some clothes on. Gee, we know that was the trashy house in the neighborhood. Look at her walking around. Like this. So now it's got underwear on at least. <laughs> it found skivvies. <laughs> we I've considered castles house for a bit. Naked before. But it was naked. Like considering everything. Because there was that, and then there was the wood panel underneath the asbestos. Like it was literally down to just like the wood that was around the frame. Right. It was it was naked. <laughs> Good to know. Well, I'll, hopefully, I'll be able to show you a little later. But yeah, definitely naked house. Uh, so yeah, and now uh, it's got underwear on, and uh, we've got to wait uh, about a week. I can't remember what it is for something to happen. Um, Oh, yes, yes. The siding that we ordered, those colors weren't actually in at that time. So it's going to take about a week to be delivered, which hopefully uh, it seems that we might have a nest of starlings in the air dryer vent. Oh, really? Yeah. And we're trying to figure out what to do. Some person, the best advice we seem to have gotten is that we'd have to try and remove it manually but without getting any human scent on it and put it somewhere nearby that's high so that mother can hear mm. and yeah, find if you them. move it too far they won't be able to find it right the problem is is that there's nothing else high well close that, by yeah there's like the tree is in front of the house and not to the side so i we're, we're you know with the activity of the bang 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 of them putting you know, the siding on, we're afraid that we might not be able to find them, although there's not going to be anything for the next week. So if mm -hmm. we do do it, and we were told that we had to do it in the day. Uh, 
but yeah, if anybody else has some tips uh, in that, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, but yeah, that there's like the only high place nearby is somewhat the garage, and I guess it has to be somewhat covered because that's why they actually went to the air vent rather than just putting themselves like high up. So, um, and there just there is nothing right. It's it's the laneway. And mm-hmm. it's the side of the house. Like next to it is another house. There's no tree. There's no other high, no other high point. And the place has to be clear for the people to work. So uh, yeah, we don't know. So we're the the chicks are already hatched because we've heard the the, the peep peeps. Um, it's just that uh, we we don't know. Like given that we have a week, will a week enough be in? Will a week be enough for them to be able to fly off on their own? Because I know that birds have to be high up to fly off the first time. Because they just sort of like jump out, and then so it has to be at a certain height. So yeah, if anybody has any tips, because we would we we don't want to do anything to hurt the baby birds <laughs> if we don't have to. But the thing is going to be sealed up, so we also don't want to trap them in our attic. All right. So if anybody has tips, yeah, wildlife control. Thank you, Kit Vim. I would definitely will give a call there. Apparently, there's a, a service here in Kingston that uh, might be able to give us uh, some advice. Okay. All right. Yeah, we uh, we looked for the Humane Society, and then uh, there was a sort of like a animal rescue, a Kingston Animal Rescue, or something like that, which apparently is where you call if it's a, you know, if it's not a pet. So, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get some advice there. All right, kids and cubs. Oh boy. Um, oh, since we're talking about good news, Leafs. Mm. Yeah, they, they pulled off a victory last night, and I didn't think they were going to. It was a pretty lackluster game, to be honest with you. I thought so, anyway. It wasn't wasn't an exciting game. Low scoring, mm-hmm. low shooting. I mean, two periods, and I think there was like 16 shots in the, after the end of the first two periods. It was like, yeah, <laughs> Boston had five shots somewhere still in the second period before yeah. they finally like, oh, I guess we need to show up to play a match or something. Yeah, like it was pretty, pretty lame. <laughs> like, I mean, really... I mean, five uh, shots in more than a period is kind of low by any standard. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in playoff hockey, when you're supposed to be like hungry and want it. Yeah. It mm. just, it just, mm. yeah. So, but hey, they we won. have a game seven, Canada. Yeah. Unexpected. Uh, but yeah, well done, Leafs. You know, well I done, mean, Leafs. I'm not a Leafs fan. Everybody knows this, but I'll, you know, but I'm a Canada fan. Respect is due. Yeah, I know. It's just, I, I just can't. And you know, you know what it is. You, you know what it is. It's not the team. It's not the players. It's not. It's the obnoxious Leafs fans. And you know who I'm talking about. They're the same as the obnoxious Senators fans and the obnoxious Habs fans. The difference being, I think there's more obnoxious Leafs fans than anything else because they're Canada's most popular team. Like it or not, it is a fact. They're the biggest, hey. second biggest money maker in the league after the New York Rangers. They're an entity unto themselves. And it's the, it's the um, ignorant, obnoxious fans that I can't stand. Okay. And that's what it is, because I got lots of friends who are Leafs fans, and we'll sit and talk about hockey for hours. But they know hockey. They know the game. It's the ones who go, eh, look at this. They, got, they won every home game in October. Uh, let's start planning the parade. Dude, it's October. <laughs> or, or, or the argument years ago, back in 2007, when Ottawa went to the finals and lost to Anaheim, when I was at a wedding reception, the, na- the next day we go to this brunch thing, and, and this guy says, "Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys got smoked there." I'm like, "No, the team did. I'm I don't play for them actually." You know, if uh, Toronto had been in the playoffs, we would have beat you in the first round. But they didn't make the playoffs, so how is that an argument? <laughs> These are the people that drive me nuts. You know, if 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 Toronto had been there, they would have beat you, but they weren't. That's not an argument. That's what drives me nuts. That. And, if and if your mother had tires, she would have been a tracker. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if my mother had wheels, she would have been a bicycle. You know, I'm like, <laughs> like what? Ah, Kit Michael says, was it an exciting game in person? Were you there, my friend? I don't know. In Ooh. person, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah. let me know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Kid Vim, I don't, I'm not sure. We, uh, you know what? I am going to say this. Canada, fuck Batman. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sing it loud, sister. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Uh, seriously, I mean, like, does anybody like that guy outside of his family? 
<laughs> I'm sure uh, he has Mike. friends. Go, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Kit Michael says I was. Oh, I am so cool. envious. How cool is that? See, look, it's starting right above my head. Yeah, that yeah, white dot. Just the way the light right hits. There. Yeah. there we go. So I have to. It's like tennis. Like the sun will eventually get to the other side of the court. <laughs> just ignore it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, Leafs and uh, Canucks uh, tonight have the chance uh, to go ahead. So hey. Uh, when it all started, like very early on, all the Canadian teams were either up one or at least tied one, and it looked like we had a chance to go four for four. The Jets are out, but hey, three out of four wouldn't be bad whatsoever. So I'll take it. Go Canada, go. That's what I say. All right. Um, and also, since we're talking sports, uh, Canada's uh, women's three by three basketball team or three on three team. Uh, because uh, I'm not sure if not everybody's familiar with that, but there is now three-on-three -three basketball. There's sh yes. shorter matches, uh, and uh, it's gained a popularity, and this year it will be an Olympic sport, and uh, the Canadian women's team are uh, the world champions at the present. Uh, so they're at uh, the qualification tournament uh, presently. Uh, in, uh, there's eight teams divided into two pools, and the winner of the tournament uh, gets uh, the qualification spot. Uh, there's eight, eight teams. Three teams, I think, are already, uh, three or four teams already qualified, so there's four spots left. Uh, so if uh, Team Canada wins this tournament, uh, they secure their spot to the Olympics. And uh, I think that would make a uh, make it such that uh, all four uh, basketball uh, events at the Olympics this year would have Canadian teams uh, registered. Cool. So that would be cool, or qualified, I should say, more than registered. Um, so, yep, good stuff here. There'll be lots to cheer for. So, uh, all right. Now, <clears throat> let's get to the serious stuff. <laughs> but, Dad, do we have to? Uh you have to eat your broccoli and you have to take your vitamins. And how can you have your pudding if you don't eat your meat? <laughs> but I'll put some I'll put some Velveeta and cheese whiz on the broccoli for you. It'll be great. <laughs> Soup and stuff, my new podcast. <laughs> so reference to Mademoiselle Fox's show last night because of soup uh, dudes, soup dudes. How did that were, go? And uh, good, really good. I thought, yeah, so. mm -hmm. yeah. good. I caught, uh, I caught just the the tail end of it yesterday, at some point. Or yeah, I, I think it was just the tail end of it. Yeah, I think you guys were just signing off actually, uh, yeah. and then I thought, like, wait a minute, they, they were talking, and then they're not. Or did I miss something? And then I went back, and then I realized, oh, okay. I guess I got there <laughs> just as it ended. The now rebranded soup cast, dudes and dudettes. But isn't, I thought dude was like a, a non gender conforming because anybody can, a person, place, a thing as a dude, right? Now you don't have to put ets on it, right? I right. mean, at, at one point in time, it wasn't the case, but I think in, in the last 20 years, that has kind of taken over because I have, I've dropped something and looked at it on the floor and went, dude, at the thing I dropped. She's laughing at me. No, I'm not. I'm just saying hi at that Oh, okay. All right. Good. good. <laughs> Babe. Please and thank you. Sure, dude. Thanks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, breaking news uh, Pierre Padiev is still behaving. Like in a the house of child. Yes. Uh, so, it seems like. Um, at first, I was thinking, you know, gee, somebody must have gotten an earful from the public. But um, then it, it, it dawned on me um, that, well, his base loves this stuff, and I doubt very much uh, that he would be uh, listening to the admonishments of, uh, of course. the people on the other side of the political spectrum, and that there's probably not that many progressive conservatives left anyway, and even if they were... Well, sorry, I shouldn't say progressive conservatives left. Progressive conservative, actual progressive conservatives have probably already left the party mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes. Um, so they're probably not calling. You know, they've probably given up on him already. Um, so the only other thing that could make me think, or that could explain in my mind, uh, this sudden change of behavior and this uh, 
sudden sudden discovery of discipline and mastery of self is that uh, he got a phone call from uh, IDU Steve. I think that might said, be it. Uh, buddy, you're fucking this up, smart nut. Yeah, yeah. I think that you're going to blow this for us. Yeah. Like not, not, no, no word of a lie. I think that may very well be the case because that was Harper's thing, right? Was that just that dull gray Mm -hmm. monotonous, boring, never get too animated, make everything sink, everything totally awful. Just sounds so reasonable. Yeah. I right. think that may be the case. Slow, slow incrementalism, frogs in a pot of boiling water type. Mm -hmm. As opposed to move fast and break things. Um, yeah. Might have, um, that's about the only thing I think can explain it because um, this is a, I think it was Chantal Hebert, I'm not sure if it was an, on an at issue or on a, the bridge with Peter's Man's Bridge, but made the comments like, you know, so Pierre doesn't listen to anyone, right? So when we were talking about that road stop, you know, is it an impromptu stop? I can't believe that. And so, oh, well, you know, maybe this is why, this is, well, you know, it's like you're driving by that like this and you see an axe, the tax leg, and say, hey, I'm going to stop to these people, stop to these people. And then you're there and it's like, wait a minute, well, you see the torn up Canada flag and the fuck Trudeau flag and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, she said, you know, if it was a if it was a bunch of Earth Day protesters, do you think he would have made an impromptu stop? No. At the side of the road. So there was definitely something that uh, caught his eye if it was indeed an impromptu stop, you know, because I still maintain is that they saw it on the way there. So Probably, yeah. They didn't know yeah. on the way back, right? So uh I mean they were there for twenty eight days. So clearly they were there when he was on the way there. Uh you know, just make a note to stop on the way back. Um I think that could be the case, yeah. Right. Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, and I don't think uh, he, she, Chantal Bear was pretty much, you know, like, like people were going like, you know, well, what was he thinking? Or was there like the staff in his car going like, no, do not stop here. This is not a good idea. I'm not the boss and you'll damn well do what I say because we have heard the stories about how he made staffers cry. And... That's also the story of how he got his lifetime compliance agreement with Elections Canada. Yes, because he's an obstinate little prick. He was wearing the polo shirt with the conservative logo on it. I'm going to do damn well what I want. And he was told that he should probably take that off. And he, yes, he did basically said, I'm going to do what I damn well want, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And then went anywhere, went anyway, and he did the event, and he got dinged. And the reason he accepted the lifetime compliance agreement is because they caught him on camera. They took pictures. It was a political event. He was in front of a lectern. He was given a speech. Mm. Wearing the shirt that he was told not to wear. But he decided he knew better. He was going to wear it anyway. He would have lost that case had it gone to court. That's why he signed. Yeah. He's a cheater. Period. He's a cheater. He actually signed a paper, said, I cheated in order to save my ass from going to court because I know I will lose because you got me on camera. There's photographic evidence. It would be a just press play prosecution they call it that's for like when you have someone on tape just press play there it is boom like this like just, just show the picture so he signed yeah he's a cheater he broke electoral law a man who broke electoral law is the leader of the conservative party of canada a party that in its first election victory also cheated he benefited from that. That's the election that got him into Parliament. He's a cheater. The way that he abuses of the House of Commons for clips and fundraising, that's cheating. That's using our funds and putting them to work for partisan purposes. 
He's literally stealing our money, misappropriating it, and using it for partisan purposes. There's a party budget for that stuff. Mm -hmm. House of Commons is to do a certain thing. If you want to get images of you doing the thing that you're supposed to do in House of Commons and use it, that's fine. That's fair game. But if you're using it as the theater, yes. for which to mount a PR campaign, that is greasy. Yes. Oops, wrong one. So, um, greasy. <laughs> These people cheat. Yes, they do. They steal, they misappropriate, they twist, they lie, they twerk. Twerk, not, not, not twerk. Twerk, twerk not twerk. Yeah, not yeah. twerk. Twerking yeah. is always appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. So, <laughs> hey, it took your mama nine months to create it. You better shake it. That's all I say. <laughs> ah, so, yeah, that is happening. He's behaving. Eyes wide open. We know what it's about. Right? Um, the other thing with this guy that he is doing because he needs to change the channel and it still has not worked. Right? We're still talking about his, uh, I, I would like to say national lampoons Atlantic Canadian vacation, but I don't really want to do that to national lampoons, but there really should be something like holiday rule. Hey, falling out of the trailer, undeshelved. I guess come for a picture. The guy comes off. He steps back. Like the guy was staggering, man. Yeah, allegedly intoxicated. Allegedly, allegedly. We don't know that he was. But he was. All signs he, point to. But listen, all I'm saying is you can't spell sloppy without PP. He looked and sounded slappy. And he was not interested in them at one point. Like, they start talking to him. Oh, what a beautiful sunset. <laughs> so where are you all from? Do you have any questions for us? No, no. I'll just ask the tags. I'll ask the tags. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just... And he... so yesterday, or not yesterday, a couple of days ago, um, they're at an event and I think it was the, the skill trades thing. It was, um, a construction union. Oh, darn. I wish I had it with me because I, I, I wasn't going to talk about this today, but it popped in this way. Um, okay. but all three, Justin Trudeau, um, um, Jagmeet Singh and Pia Paliyev were at this uh, uh, were at this event. Uh, oh, somebody! I will find it, kids. I, I'm I'm looking for it. I will find it. And they were giving a speech, and it's to people in uh, the construction and uh, and trades section sector. Oh yes, I know how to find it. Okay, I remember what word I used. It. There we go. I'm just trying, trying to fix some stuff in the background here because, you know, that's what I do. There we fix go. Stuff. Okay. Uh, and it disappeared in the National Post. Right. So he went to, uh, the, again, the National Post. So this is something. Right. This is by journalist Catherine Levesque. And it says, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev got muted support from construction workers and tradespeople after delivering a campaign-style speech illustrating the uphill battle that aspiring prime minister still has in wooing the country's blue-collar unions. In fact, 
Poliev only managed to garner some applause from the room when he spoke about tax credits for travel and ending subsidies for foreign workers, which paled in comparison to NDP leader Jagmeet Singh's standing ovation minutes before. Of course. Poliev was the third political leader to speak at the Canada Building Trades Unions annual conference in Gatineau, Quebec. That's the, the, the name I was looking for and I couldn't find kids. After Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Singh but he did not participate in a fireside chat to answer questions like the first two. Instead, he offered a speech about the rising cost of homes, quote, just inflation, and how the working class has become the, quote, working poor by giving the example of a carpenter who lives in northern Ontario who he said lived in his car because rent is too expensive. So once again just like it was the case for the people by the side of the road. He went to them. He talked at them. But when it came time for questions, when the case is by the side of the road, is did he have any questions for them? No, because he's not interested in them. This time it was, hey, construction and trade workers. Do you have any questions for me? And he didn't stay for them. He gave about a 30-minute speech. He was two-thirds in the way into it before he got some applause. He was dying up yeah. there. I didn't see it. You've seen it? I didn't see the speech. No, this is just from a report in uh, the oh, National, okay. uh, National Post. I, I will be looking for it to, to see if it uh, is available uh, to see. Because it's like the speech for the, the Canadian uh, Association of Police. They're not necessarily... Those ones are not necessarily broadcast, right? Right. <clears throat> so, Although that speech is available, the, the CPA speech. The transcript is, or is, or, or the like there is video. saying it. There's video. Okay. I've seen him, the video of him saying it at the CPA, the Canadian okay. Police. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. So we, I, we, I'd have to go out and actually specifically look for it here. Yes, so, it is available though. It's like, gee, it's almost like when PP chooses to speak to experts in their field. They can tell he's a serial bullshitter. Mm -hmm. Getting no love from uh, the common man when Jagmeet Singh got a standing ovation minutes before must have really bruised his ego. I have no doubt. I expect him to lash out soon. Well, you know. Going to say something. Uh wouldn't, and then the wouldn't article surprise goes, me in the least. Yep. And uh, the article then goes on. I love this. Kathleen Monk, a former NDP strategist and director of communications to the late Jack Layton, was in the room and said Podiev didn't necessarily connect with the audience for a number of reasons. And the story about the carpenters was one of them, she said. Obviously, he didn't get a good brief. The carpenters aren't in the room, nor are they affiliated with the Canadian Building Trades, nor are they affiliated to Canadian Labour Congress. They're actually outside of the House of Labour, she said. <laughs> Knowing your audience is always key. So there were some missteps there, I think. <laughs> you think? She slices, she dices, she juliennes. <laughs> but wait, that's not all. If you act now... Jeez, you can hear the nail file. <laughs> I don't think he's getting good briefs. And if he's not being really, really well briefed on that, what else is he not being really well briefed on? Well, he's he's a know-it-all narcissist, right? So uh, he just doesn't give a shit. He doesn't. He doesn't give a damn. One must wonder. And, uh, well, then... Uh, Several participants declined to share their thoughts on Polyev's speech before the media were asked to leave the premises. Only one participant who did not share his name said it would have been, quote, nice if Polyev had answered the CBTU's questions. Instead, the conservative leader spent most of his speech detailing his four key campaign commitments to verb the noun, verb the noun, verb the noun, and verb the noun. Or, sorry, yeah, verb the noun, that's it. Quote, 
Oh, sorry, I need that again. Monk, again. <clears throat> I don't think he read the room, said Monk, who is president of the public affairs for Monk and Associates. I did see a lot of recycled material in the speech, stuff that didn't necessarily connect with this audience. Wow. <laughs> and once again, I think I'm he's, he's really he's really showing his cards here, and the cards are he, he got nothing. They're face cards, nothing else. He he's got nothing, and and people are beginning to recognize that he has nothing. This is a prime example, and and the people that he's going after, laborers, who he says he likes workers, but he's voted against everything that would benefit both laborers and unions. He's Ex voted for right to work legislation, which is from the U S which is smashing unions. Yes. He does. He's not on your side and people are yeah. beginning to see through his bullshit. Thank goodness. Except surprisingly, it seems that the anti scab legislation passed unanimously. Yeah. And he actually voted in support of it, which I was surprised at. Like, where did that come from? What, what I, I'm going to shut up and take the W. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, hey, that's that's a, a broken clock, right? Twice a day, he was right about that, it. That it was the right thing I to would. do. I, I'm like literally shocked. Did he did he cast his ballot and go, oh shit, I hit the wrong button? Like, <laughs> you know how you hit send on the email before you finished editing? Oh, oh crap! See, now this is where my stupid brain goes. Mm -hmm. To say like that Brazilian judge at the Olympics when she made a yes. Sylvie Frechette score. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> that's a will. That's a really specific reference, kids. <laughs> you got to You got to You got to be there. You got to be there. A whole bunch of weird information stored in this thing that's completely useless. <laughs> I'm a weird person. Okay. Ah, um, uh, we so like yes. the weirdos, though. <laughs> uh, the first applause in Polyev's nearly 30-minute speech came at about the 20-minute mark, blah, 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 when he promised to adopt conservative MPs Chris Luce's private member's bill that would let tradespeople deduct travel expenses. The bill is currently in the Senate. Well, yeah, that, well, that's a damn good idea. Let's do that. But, yeah. okay. But it's a private member's bill. It's not even his own idea. <laughs> no, of course it's not. Of course it isn't. Hey, come on. Remember who we talked about here. The, the one time he got applause, the, one, the first thing for which he got applause is something that's not even his own idea. Again. He was dying up there. Oh, my God. He hasn't got a leg to stand on. Oh, shit. Uh, the room also applauded Fadiyev for promising to, quote, put an end to the abuse of the temporary foreign worker program. Well, I think everybody wants that. So, yes. My government policy. Oh, here we go. My government policy will be very simple. That's usually a bad sign. If problems were actually simple to solve, they'd be solved. They wouldn't be problems. Problems are complex. Most are. Uh, yeah. Uh, I always beware of the person that says the solution or the problem is easy. The problem is easy. Only I can. Oh. Also, <laughs> in politics, that's usually wrong. <laughs> that's usually wrong. Uh, my government policy... <clears throat> My government policy will be very simple. There will be no tax dollars to subsidize foreign workers. Our tax dollars are for our workers in this country, period. Well, I mean, I can't argue with that, but... Mm -hmm. Wasn't it his party that, that augmented the rules around temporary mm -hmm. foreign workers? <laughs> the advantage of corporations. <laughs> yep, he was there for it. And and You've I been do remember attention, though, Mr. Grizzly. Oh yeah, I do remember when Harper actually came in and changed the rules again when they saw how much abuse was taking place. When a big uh, corporation that makes hamburgers and has served billions was bringing in f temporary foreign workers from other mm -hmm. parts of the world, telling them to live in this cheap house that they owned. And, and, you know and then making it? them work stupid hours. And it was like a two hour commute just to get to their workplace. Yeah. That is abusive. I remember. And they were paying them $2 rules. less per hour. Yeah. And do we, minimum wage. Do we remember who changed the rules the first time? 
Yeah, it was Harper. Kenny. Oh, it was Kenny. He was the minister of immigration at the time. He's the one under Harper. Talking. Yes, right. Yes. 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 The guy that That's everybody. That's right. I had, remember that. Yes. Right. Remember, there was a reason we called him Bumbles because for some reason nobody understands. Nobody on this side of the spectrum understands how this man became a star because every single ministerial portfolio he was given, without exception, he bungled. <laughs> he literally got to the premiership of Alberta on the strength of his big mouth. Because it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's just uh, like this. The only thing he did very well was the outreach to immigrant to ethnic communities mm -hmm. in the first few years, which they all torched with the barbaric practices snitch line and one. <laughs> as soon as they took him out of that position, they just started torching the, that relationship. So it's like, and he's trying, can you see Kenny's trying to pop up every now and then now too, lately. He's on a, trying to be on some type of redemption tour. It's like, you stay in that box. <laughs> <laughs> the people of Alberta put you there for a reason, dude. <laughs> it's not time to come out yet. This is not your moment. Stay down. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, this is not your how do you like me now time. <laughs> George Bush, after Trump came along, that's a legitimate how do you like me now time. This is not your how do you like me now time. You stay down. <laughs> Jeez. God, the last thing we need is for him to start sticking his nose in the stuff too. My God. So yeah. He is a... Uh, not doing very well whatsoever. Uh, the CBTU had recently written to Trudeau demanding that he personally intervene as the union claimed local workers were being sidelined by foreign employees at the new Nexstar electric vehicle plant in Windsor. Uh, electric vehicle battery plant, sorry. Trudeau assured the crowd during a fireside chat with Sean Strickland, CBTU's executive director, on Monday that he would do everything he could to protect local jobs and committed to ensuring that most jobs for electrical vehicle projects would remain local. Um, and, and, uh, there's a Canada's national observer has a, a, a more in-depth article on what uh, the prime minister said there. If people are interested in that, mm. um, as for Mr. Singh on Tuesday, uh, the article says Singh preemptively took shots at Polyev in front of the hundreds of tradespeople during the conference, arguing that he's not a true ally for union workers. Quote, I just want to remind folks that your real friends are there with you always, not when they're trying to maneuver themselves and maybe win an election. Your real friends are there always, and your real friends are with you when you're in a fight, said Singh. Strickland also praised the NDP leader for helping the labor movement introduce, quote, more progressive legislation than we have in any other five-year period of history in Canada, noting that the anti-scab legislation is one of those landmark pieces. I will repeat this kits and cubs because remember the NDP did not do this alone Strickland also praised the NDP leader for helping the labor movement introduce quote more progressive legislation than we have in any other five year period of history if you're a worker as PP would like to define worker. Mm -hmm. But if you are blue collar and you have this guy whispering in your ear how you've never had it so bad. Which we all know is a the president. gigantic pile of unpleasantness, the, which, you yeah. know. <laughs> the president of Canada's Building Trades Union specifically said on the record there's never been more progressive legislation in favor of workers in a five-year period introduced than in the last five than under this government i believe that's um that's a moment for this just give me a second. ah darn it i can't find what i'm looking for oh there it is found it And this is why I keep on saying, wouldn't a Canada were the one with the parties that flip between one and two 
are the NDP and the Liberals be much better than in Canada, where the parties that flip one and two are the Liberals and the Conservatives? Well, again, because there is no Conservative Party anymore, especially so, right? Right. There's if there no were progressive conservative. conservative, yeah, but there's no, there's none. It doesn't exist. It's gone completely. It's gone. This, the, it's just conservative. The word conservative is just branding at this point. That's all it is. Nothing more. Yeah. So you have this. Uh, so you have PP who's trying to make all of this roadside thing go away with his. Like, hey, I'm going to trample your rights. And then his little outburst on the hill. And then they're trying to get uh, the speaker to resign. And, uh, but the issue is still there. We're still talking about what he did. We're still talking about his lack of judgment. Oh, yes. It's not working. So, um, yeah, be ready to um, see uh, a lot more of this stuff going on because right now he's not controlling the narrative. No, he is not. And another way that his comms do, people must be losing their minds right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm convinced they're like, what? He, he has not controlled the narrative since the liberals started the pre budget tour. This is true. It's about a month now. Yeah. This is yes, sir. unfamiliar territory uh, for him. And uh, you can tell that they are scrambling and panicking. And this is uh, the latest way. You know how we were talking about he was trying to associate, um, basically saying that, you know, the liberals have legalized hard drugs, which is not the case, and have allowed for uh, legalized open use of drugs in places like hospitals and on playgrounds and parks and schools and that type of stuff, which is also not true. Well, the other thing that uh, Pierre likes to do is uh, have someone read the headlines for tragedies. It's just, it's just... And then he tries to find a way to relate the tragedy to a policy. And then once again, make everything just one man's fault. Which again, when he says my solutions are simple or my policy is simple, that also is simple. Everything wrong in the world is just one man's fault. Yeah. is a simple explanation from a simple mind. Basically, yeah, nothing more. I have this clip you just sent me uh, ready to roll if you want to. Uh, yep. We can have a look at this. This is... Uh, I've called this one no tragedy he will not exploit. Here we go. In Canada's biggest city... Gun crime is up 66%. It's 100% nationwide. I just uh, shared the tragic story of someone out on bail slamming his car into an innocent family. Two wonderful grandparents dead. A beautiful baby dead. He was out on bail under the Prime Minister's catch and release C-75. How many more will have to die before he repeals catch and release and brings jail, not bail, for repeat offenders? Well, here's the thing. Um, if, it's, if it's jail, not bail, why isn't Tamara Leach and all of her friends locked up still? Yeah. So, we had the case of Amar Zamir, right? Mm-hmm. There's a terrible incident. Police officer dies because police officer is dead in the line of duty automatically. It's first degree murder. Yes. That's just an, there is the, thing. there is the video like the prosecuting attorneys 
get to see it. Everybody gets to see it. They decide to go forward with this case anyway. There are coordinated stories. A man's life is completely turned upside down. Mm-hmm. And it turns out uh, that the coordinated stories, uh, to be generous, did not hold up in the face of evidence. We will say. <clears throat> so much so that the judge apologized because it was a case that never should have gone to court. It was something that should never have happened as a result of police. Um, lack of judgment, we will say. Well, in this case, it seems that the whole reason that this, these two grandparents and this infant died was because there was a off-duty officer who observed a robbery at a liquor store, phoned it in. He decided, even though he was off-duty, or they, I guess, decided if they were off-duty to pursue the robbery or the robber. Mm -hmm. At some point, Durham police took over, and for some reason, uh, the chase ended up with this guy in a rental U-Haul van. I think there may have been a knife, that he had a knife. Yeah, uh, I don't know the sure. details um, of that. Okay, that. That one I'm not clear, uh, but I hear, did hear something in one of the reports I was looking and uh, I was hearing with regard to a knife. Um, but the police car chased them onto the 401 and Whitby going the wrong way. Yeah. Now, high-speed chases are already known to be dangerous. Incredibly dangerous. They're usually frowned upon by police associations, and usually the protocol is such that once you are able to identify the vehicle, the, the driver, or the license plate, you stop. That's for a regular, just your everyday sort of high-speed chase. Mm-hmm. For one that's going the wrong way down the 401, Canada is actually the world's have, biggest, the world's busiest highway. You would think it would have to be something absolutely exceptional. Mm-hmm. It was a liquor store theft. Did, did we have some board officers who just wanted to get in on the action or something? Because come on, and it what, seems, what do they tell the employees at the liquor store? Don't do anything. Do not engage. And it seems that they were advised by dispatch to not do what they decided Did. to do. So some heads are going to roll. So three people are dead as a result of a high-speed chase the wrong way down a highway that people decided to engage in against order. And because the person they were chasing happened to be out on bail, PP takes all that Mm -hmm. stuff away and says, it's the prime minister's jail or bail policies that resulted in these three people being dead. Not bad judgment on the police officer, not bad judgment on anybody that had a po- that instituted a high speed chase that shouldn't have happened, not anybody that decided to pursue this guy on the highway. No, 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 going the wrong way. No, three people are dead because of bad choices and a chase that should never have happened. Just as Mr. Zamir's court case should never have happened. And in both cases, we had conservatives. There's nothing they won't exploit. And again, these well, are not conservatives. These are reformers. Like, oh my God, how could he still be out on jail and all that kind of stuff? It's ter- terrible. And this guy here, it's like, these three, the person, somebody that was out on bail was somehow involved again in another tragic accident. Mm-hmm. Fueled by police choices that should never have been made. And they were told not to make them, and they did they it told anyway. Not to make them, and 
this also it brings to mind a past case in Ontario mm -hmm. where there are three OPP officers in a custody case where there was a father and son in a car and they were being pursued and there was a collision not with between the police and the car but there was a collision with the car with the father and son and the police had been notified that a gun may be in the vehicle when they got out of the vehicle they got to the car they saw that a gun had fallen out and even though they had been instructed to back off they chose to open fire in response killing both the father and the son great the crown eventually in that case withdrew the charges because they said there was no reasonable prospect of conviction because they said we saw a gun we had reasonable fear of person of a gun but again they were told to back off just like these ones were told to not pursue this and there's actually protocol that says once you've identified the license plate you no longer pursue because with the license plate they could have contacted you you taught you all found out who rented that and, and then you know proceed to arrest him at another time the leader of the opposition is taking tragedies removing the entire context from them taking one little fact about it mm -hmm. the guy happened to be out on bail and then is using it to prosecute the prime minister of canada is not doing everything to keep us safe we don't even know for what reason this guy was on bail no doesn't matter to pp everyone out on bail is an equally heinous criminal even if people should die as a result of them being in an accident from a high-speed chase that never should have happened yeah there's no tragedy he will not exploit nothing he will not twist all of the stories have little elements of truth nuggets little nuggets so much is pulled out removed erased shifted to create a story that is nothing like what happened in reality I mean, so he's thrown all of this at us, but we're still talking. We're still talking about the roadside stop. This is sticking, and if it invites a new era of scrutiny, uh, I'm for it. I said. I've been saying it for uh, months now. His worst enemy is time. Well, and, and I the more said, time we get to actually know them, if people, if media is actually interested in doing the work of journal, committing journalism and actually digging, the more we get to know them, the more it will be clear just how unacceptable he is as a candidate. Well, and, and I didn't expect him to last this long, honestly. I'm surprised he's been in this position for as long as he has. I thought he would have been gone by now. But as time marches on, people are really beginning to see who he is. And even the staunch, hardcore, died in the wool, I vote blue no matter who, they're, those folks are kind of going like, whoa, this is insane. This is, this is not right. And I've heard that from a lot of people. And again, I know a lot of old, old, older conservatives who have voted NDP in the last few elections because they'll never vote liberal but they cannot vote for the reform party. And that's, that's literally what it boils down to. They cannot vote for the reform party. And that's, that's who's in power or that's who's in opposition right now is the reform party. Mm -hmm. 
Not the Conservative Party of Canada. I know that's what its name is, but it's not It's not the Conservative Party. Yeah. I'd like to finish off this section by um, a really interesting editorial that I saw in the Hamilton Spectator uh, from a couple of weeks ago. I've been oh, saving it for an occasion just like this. Um, April 17th. Uh, by Craig Wallace. You cannot run a country on outrage and insults. If recent polls remain the same, sometime between now and October 2025, Conservative Party of Canada leader Pierre Polyev will become Canada's next Prime Minister. If the CPC does take power, it will be interesting to see what type of government they will be. Certainly, it is hard to tell, as to date they appear to have no plan as to how they will govern. They have released no policies on climate change outside of opposing the current carbon tax and vowing to eliminate it. What would they say, replace, sorry, what would they replace it with, or do they even believe in climate change? The CPC won't say. They denounce the current state of the Canadian military, however, they refuse to outline their own plan on how to rebuild our armed forces. What would they do with taxes? Who knows? One area we know a CPC government will continue to embrace is anger and an utter lack of class and decorum. For example, on April 4th, veteran New York Democratic Party MP Charlie Angus announced that he will not seek re-election in the next federal election after more than 20 years in Parliament. For the record, I rarely agreed with Mr. Angus's politics, but I greatly admired his support for the First Nations and his outstanding ability to represent his constituents. In 2006, the Toronto Star selected him as one of the 10 top opposition MPs, and in 2012, McLean's magazine voted him as one of the 25 most influential Canadians. So how did Polyev react with this news? On X, previously known as Twitter, Polyev tweeted, quote, Charlie Angus jumped ship rather than face voters after he voted to hike the carbon tax and ban the hunting rifles of Northern Ontarians. Common sense conservatives will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime, and let you keep your hunting rifle. And it wasn't just Pierre Polyev, conservative MP Stephanie Cousy, yeah, shown on the show, commented, quote, I'd like to thank the member for Timmins James Bay for relieving us of our misery and announcing his resignation. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate that. You know, we're real, really going to miss him on this side of the house. Nat. I'm not blind to the fact that modern society is far coarser than in the past. Having said that, is it too much to ask our elected leaders to act in a dignified professional manner as opposed to juvenile behavior that should have been left in high school? Would it have been so hard to thank Mr. Angus for his 20 years of devoted service to Canada and wish him well? And let's not fall back to the, quote, the other parties are just as bad. A good way to differentiate yourself from the other parties is to conduct yourself with class dignity and statesmanship. Conservative leaders were not always this crass. Here in Ontario, in the last 70 years, we saw highly successful dignified premiers in Leslie Frost, John Robarts, and Bill Davis. All of them were policy-driven, made decisions based on objective evidence and logic, and behaved in classy, dignified ways. Federally, in my lifetime, while not as successful as the Ontario Premiers, Conservative Party leaders Robert Stanfield and Joe Clark stood out for their decency and well-thought-out and detailed policy alternatives. Recently deceased Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney was renowned for his kindness and class. People from all over the political spectrum spoke about how Mulroney reached out to them when they were in a time of need. One wonders why Polyev and his party feel it is necessary to behave as uncouth boars so much of the time. Polyev and the CBC need to understand that you cannot run a country on outrage and insults. It's about time for them to show Canadians that they can act in a classy manner and provide detailed policy alternatives. You Thank know, you, sir. The, you, <laughs> mentioned, you mentioned John Robarts, and he is the greatest premier this country has ever had and the greatest premier the province of Ontario has ever known, period, bar none. They built from nothing. John Robarts and his cabinet built the, the uh, community college a system in the province of Ontario from scratch. They built Ontario Place. They helped with worker legislation. John Robarts was a true progressive, a true progressive in the vein of Stanfield and Clark. And that is, I, I miss that so much. And again, remember, I do not belong to any political party. I never have and I never will. And I vote in every single election, municipal, provincial, and federal. And I always will. And I have voted for every party. Well, the four major parties, right? Green, NDP, Liberal, Conservative, Progressive Conservative, which doesn't exist anymore. The no, never the Marxist, Leninist, or the Communist parties. I voted for the four major parties, the ones that can actually, you know, do something to help us out. And I will continue to do that. Although right now there is not a member of the Conservative Caucus that would ever get my vote. 
I, I thought there were a few decent ones among them, but they keep they keep pulling or, or, or towing the Polyev line, not the party line, but the Polyev line, which is a different thing. And I just I can't I can't stand in support of that. And I think there's a lot of members of the caucus, and, and you tell me if I'm way off base on this, sir. But I think there's a lot of members of the conservative caucus that. Um, are actually progressives and got into this to make a difference. And then they discovered this is just a damn reform party. And some of them either went along with it or got so disgusted that they just don't give a shit. And they're going to wait till their time is up and leave. Mm. I hope to think there's those people in there who've come to the realization that they can't change the party from within. Look what happened to Aaron O'Toole. He tried to bring it closer to the middle. They kneecapped him yep. and gave him the boot. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, these are not good people for the most part. Polyev is not a good person. He's not. No. He does not have your interest at heart. He has his interest and those of his wealthy donors. That's it. That is it. He's a reformer through and through, dyed in the wool. He does not care about you. Yep. He doesn't. He will serve his master, Stephen Harper in the IDU, and Preston Manning to a, a to a, a lesser degree, but definitely. And that's it. They will they will rob you of your rights. You know how many of the members of the Conservative Caucus uh, score high in the CLC uh, meter? The CLC is the the campaign li uh, life coalition. Mm, yes. These are the folks who want to rob women of their right to make a choice. And and yeah. you know people get mad. Well, I'm against abortion. You can be. You can be against abortion and still be pro-choice because it's not your body. You cannot decide for another human being what they do with their body. Because here's the thing. Once you rob them of that choice, what's next? Oh, we're going to outlaw tattoos or piercings. And you think I'm being ridiculous, right? How about Afghanistan where women have to wear full burqas? Because a religious group of men who, who, who feign religion decided that this is now the law. It starts out incrementally and they move up from there. Let's not backslide. We have come so far in the last 30 years. We, we, are, we have equality for everybody now that we've never had before. And we still have ways to go, don't get me wrong. But my goodness gracious, let's not backslide, folks. Do not let these narrow-minded narcissists take over our democracy. Do not allow these people to rob you of the rights that were fought for by people who sacrificed more than we'll ever know for us to have those rights. And when I say us, I mean every single Canadian. Every single one of us. Because, yeah, it's easy for me cis, het, white, male, six foot tall. Come on. I'm at the top of the white privilege pyramid. I know this. I know this. But it is incumbent, or, or incumbent, that's not even the right term. It is imperative that I use that white privilege to make a difference, to inform people, to let people know that these rights that we have, that we take for granted, can be robbed from us. And if we don't pay attention, they will be. Mm -hmm. uh, since you, uh, again, wasn't going to talk about this because I didn't have much more information other than uh, what uh, Nate put up, but uh, since you raised uh, the issue uh, of abortion, um, I'm going to slide this little bit of information in here if you would uh, read it uh, to the kids and cubs, Mr. Grizzly. This is from uh, the Breakdown Alberta, our friend Nate. And uh, boy, oh boy, why am I not surprised? I, I, I expected this. From the uh, DMs, we've received several DMs that multiple UCP MLAs and at least one minister are actively working to introduce changes to health care that will see access to abortion severely limited. It seems the UCP are coming for women's health care. Now here's the thing. They start with limiting your access and eventually they take it away. It's, again, incremental steps. You don't have to be for abortion. You don't. You can be dead set against it. But 
robbing somebody of the choice is wrong. And I know there's people who are mad at me for saying this, but they're like, it's a child, not a choice. You're not in that person's shoes. You don't get to decide what they do. You don't have to live their life, and you're not going to pay for that child. So unless you plan on supporting that child, don't tell a person what to do. Period. Yeah. Period. Indeed, indeed. I agree with you, uh, Mr. Grizzly. Um, whoops. <laughs> My screen there. There you go. And you know, let's try to put it up there for everyone to see. All right. Um, so Kit just asked me something here I, uh, on the chat. And, uh, oh, darn. I'm sorry. Somebody had asked me a question and I wanted to answer it. Uh, and I can't remember what the question is. So sorry. Um, I'll uh, scroll down and hopefully find it later. But uh, it seems that uh, a lot is. Oh, yes. Tabby G said, did anyone see Charlie Angus post from last night? Uh, please uh, post it into the. The tweet because I, I went looking for it and I didn't uh, immediately see it. Yeah, if you can um, put a, give us right. a link in the chat there, we'll see if we can dig it up. I, I haven't seen it. All right, moving away from that, uh, Mr. Grizzly, it seems that um, something I had been warning about for the longest time, and yes. uh, this is going to you um, did. turn your mic a bit, sir. Oh, you. sorry, yeah. there we go. Um, I'm going to take us back to the days of Jody Wilson-Raybould when she was Minister of Justice. Um, I have maintained for the longest time mm -hmm. that um, even though it was a wonderful thing to make history uh, by having the first Indigenous Minister of Justice, um, this particular Minister of Justice was very, 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 very bad at her job. And one of the reasons I said that wasn't only because there was that uh, man who was innocent, uh, whose file was on her desk, and she decided not to move it forward. Right. But when it came to legalization of marijuana, there was some changes to the uh, criminal code that would allow police to be able to um, test you. Right. For impairment, whether they had cause to believe you were impaired or not. Yeah, and that's and a I said, slope, right? And I said, oh my God, I can't believe she just brought carding to cars. Because we had a huge problem with carding in to Toronto. In Toronto yeah. Right. And then we found a way to eliminate that. And then she came in and she put this law. And, guess, and for some reason, she added this thing. Because back then, everybody's going, well, what if everybody like you know, gets high and then drives? Like, people didn't have access to pot before the law and <laughs> didn't have access to a car and pot at the same time yeah. before the law. Since the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Apparently, yeah, this was going to be sure. a new thing the potential of people. Uh, and she decided to slip this and I never saw anything happen. So I thought, Oh my God, I was wrong. Well, slowly some uh, municipalities and areas have, uh, have decided to bring it and to try it. And, uh, it seems that according to Steve Sullivan of mothers against drug driving Canada, mm -hmm. Um, he said, too many folks are making this that selfish choice of driving impaired. I think that there was a little bit of hesitation from some police service to see how the courts might interpret this. And so far at every court case, it has been upheld as constitutional. So this has actually been legal since 2018, mm -hmm. but very few police officers and police forces have decided to actually pursue this. Uh, but now it seems that, uh, Saskatchewan announced that it was going to do it a couple, a uh, couple of days or weeks ago, and now it looks like it's going to be uh, uh, being adopted by the OPP as well. Interesting. So there will be they call it MAS mandatory alcohol screenings for every traffic stop in the GTA. 
uh, we'll be that's a charter that. challenge right there. Exactly, it's and I think challenge. that's why that's why a lot of people were doing. And apparently, there has, like I said, there's been some challenges in court up until a certain point. But so far, it's all been uh, deemed constitutional. Uh, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, mm-hmm. who maybe frustrated us a bit mm-hmm. when it was the convoy stuff, mm-hmm. right here. And this is why I'm saying this is why we need them because this is what they do. Yes. Doesn't matter what the case is. We might not like where, what we're doing. Where could be the civil? Because it depends where you are on the subject, right? Mm-hmm. But they're there. They zoom in. It's like where this. Like, I've had conversations with people online. Says, "What you want people to still to be able to drive drunk?" It's like, well, of course it. They can't right people. now. <laughs> I don't want people to drive drunk. I want people to be prevented from unreasonable search and seizure because we saw how that worked with carding, and we yeah. saw mostly who, yeah, got carded. Well, and and you know. You will hear like a, <laughs> you'll hear a statement oftentimes. The suspect is known to police. Yes, you know why they're known to police because they carted them and recorded it. So every black man they saw walking down the streets of Toronto, they would card them, record it, put it in their database. The suspect is known to police. Yeah, carding was bad. Yes. It's a bad idea. So Shakira him of the CCLA objects says quote. We think this could be an issue that goes to the Supreme Court of Canada to make an ultimate determination. It is going to disproportionately affect members of racialized communities who are already stopped by the police for unjustified reasons. So here's a good question from Linda. Can they breathalyze people at random checkpoints or only if they stop the car for a reason? Now, here's the thing. They have to have a legitimate traffic violation reason to stop you to begin with. Yes. Ride programs have been deemed to be unconstitutional, but we look the other way on them. They are unconstitutional. They're stopping you for no good reason. Stopping but, every vehicle. Yes. Not just one random vehicle that was weaving in and out of traffic or braking or speed. They stop every vehicle. That is unconstitutional. It's an unconstitutional stop. It's an unconstitutional search. It is unconstitutional, period, end of story. But we look the other way. When it comes to that, because there are times of the year, December, Christmas time, New Year's, that ride programs are given a pass in the public interest. Yes. Like this, so long as every car is treated the same. Yes. We look the other way on that, but from a charter challenge, it's been ruled unconstitutional. There's Mm -hmm. no question, but we still allow it because it does protect the public in the name of the greater good. But now but this just is... just pull a vehicle over for no reason? Well, we're just going to give you a breathalyzer. It's like, nope, I'm driving away. Well, this Did is I not, weave? This is, Did I yeah. stop? Was I erratic? Was I speeding? Did I not signal at a turn? Yeah. No, you didn't so do like, any of those things. Then I'm driving away. Yeah. But this is, if you do do that, mm-hmm. if you do fail to signal or broken taillight or... This. Yeah. You get one. Yeah. And if it's mandatory because it applies to everyone, then that's probably the whole basis on which ultimately I'm figuring if it has been deemed constitutional so far, mm-hmm. that's the basis because when it was carding, it wasn't they weren't carding everyone on the street, they were selecting with a card. If yes. every stop car they stop gets a mandatory breathalyzer test, then you're not getting tested because Correct. you're black. This. Correct. But this multiplies and lengthens police. Well, it doesn't multiply police interactions because they would be stopped anyway and there'd be an interaction like this, but lengthens police interactions, making it more likely that something could happen somewhere along the way. And just, anyway, uh, the CCLA argues that random testing is an unjustifiable violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's search and seizure without cause, an experience that can be humiliating and degrading and result in arbitrary detention. And that's, uh, again, we're hoping that because it's a breathalyzer, it has to actually ring so that you would be detained so it wouldn't be arbitrary, but um, who knows? Uh as we see in the new Barnes Samir case, there are certain officers that are willing to 
go on the stand and all the way up to the point of going on the stand in the court after they sworn under oath and still give untrue testimony. So he blew a positive or you blew a warning. <clears throat> you, you, are right about, you are right about this PNC bio. Don't just drive away, settle it in court. Just driving away will yes. for sure land you in trouble. You are correct. Yes. You are correct. Yes. My emotion is, eh, that's my emotion. That's my emotion. Yes. 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 Do not put yourself in a situation. But, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm weird about this. Mm -hmm. uh, now, yeah, please no, it's, say it's that good. impaired driving collisions and charges are at a five year high, which is what is motivating this. So, um, Devils are really in the details here. We, uh, this may ultimately end up being nothing, but they're asking us for a lot of trust here. Oh, yes. I'll say. So, hopefully, um, this will go through seamlessly but you know like i said um after all everybody is human and um humans make mistakes and humans have bad days and humans so um yeah hopefully this will not be abused um small little tidbit canada's first arctic and offshore offshore patrol vessel will be brought into the pacific fleet today so when we talk about military procurement and things take a long time, this is a project that took a while. <laughs> so we, we're finally having one. Uh, apparently, uh, Princess Anne will take part in the commissioning ceremony in her role as Commodore-in-Chief for the Canadian Fleet Pacific. Um, that's about all the details I have uh, at the moment. I'll see if I can find a little something uh later on to uh, add a little more to that but i thought uh, it's always nice to we often hear about the orders and everything being you know fought about and challenged and whatnot but it's like we actually have a delivery mm. <laughs> coming in function yay us we did something <laughs> i have the uh, charlie angus tweet whenever uh, whenever you want me oh to. yes thank you so much I can, i'll post it on the screen and i'll read it out to everybody this is a quotation. Politics is not a spectator sport. It is a participation sport. Pierre Polyev. Urging supporters to target, target liberal NDP offices. Now, that's conjecture on Charlie Angus's part. Uh, it's a read between the lines statement. Mm -hmm. But that is what has taken place. Okay. Parliament has sent warning to our staff. Lock doors, get to someplace safe, use panic but button if at risk. This is the politics of intimidation in action. And here I've got a list, uh, there's a, a, a list of things there to do. Uh, the first one is do not get involved and go somewhere safe. The second is avoid physical altercations even if provoked. The third, close and lock all exterior doors. The fourth, fourth, advise the local authorities of any demonstration and, once it is safe to do so, notify the office of the sergeant at arms and corporate security at the phone number uh, and the email address, as the situation could have an impact on Parliament Hill or other constituency offices. Refrain from posting anything related to the demonstration on social media. If the situation becomes volatile and your security is at risk, call 911 or activate the duress alarm that may be installed in your office to alert local emergency services and consider evacuating your location. If you are approached outside your office and feel that your security is at risk, activate your mobile duress button to immediately alert your police, uh, alert your police of jurisdiction. I didn't know they had mobile duress buttons. Wow. That's, uh, they make sense. I didn't know they had that though. Hmm. Must be, is that something on their phone or is it just like a little pager or I don't know. I've never heard of that. I wouldn't know at all. Um, I have, uh, more information. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I cut you off. Were you done? No, that's fine. That's, that was, I was done. I was done. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that I, that I didn't cut, cut off or cut you off, uh, about the, the, the patrol ship here. Um, 
this is according to City News, Canada's first Arctic and offshore patrol vessel will officially be brought into the Pacific fleet today, and Princess Anne, the sister of King Charles, is scheduled to take part in its commissioning ceremony. News release says Anne will be attending the ceremony in her role as Commodore-in-Chief for the Canadian fleet Pacific. National Defence says HMCS Max Bernays arrived in its new home port in Esquimalt last month, calling it a pivotal milestone in the expansion of the fleet. And uh, when I saw the name, I was wondering, well, who the heck is Max Bernays? Because that was a new name to me. And uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, Max Bernays AOPB 432 is, sorry, the, well, sorry. That's the vessel. Is <laughs> the Max Bernays CGMCD was a Royal Canadian Naval Reserve Acting Chief Petty Officer who fought in the Battle of the Atlantic during the Second World War. He was awarded the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal for his actions aboard HMCS Assiniboine on August 6, 1942. So this would be the third Harry DeWolf class offshore patrol vessel for the Royal Canadian Navy, and uh, they're naming it uh, in uh, in his honor. Um. It says that uh, a statement from the office of the uh, Lieutenant Governor last week said the Princess and her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence, would attend a series of events during a three-day trip to BC, starting with the commissioning ceremony for the ship in North Vancouver. It said that it will be followed by an overnight sail to Esquimalt on Vancouver Island. And then uh, the Princess's itinerary includes a visit to the archives and collection space of the Maritime Museum of British Columbia and Victoria, which was founded with an initial donation by the Princess's late father, Prince Philip. She's also scheduled to attend a commemorative service marking the Battle of Atlantic and the British Columbia Legislature and lay a wreath, as well as visit the Military Family Resource Centre. And then uh, she's also supposed to meet with the Lieutenant Governor of BC, Janet Austin, and other community leaders. Um, but there you go. Uh, hopefully there'll be more um, news according to uh, Canada.ca here. Uh, the event schedule says that today, May 3rd, uh, the world of warships with Commander RCN will happen uh, from 11 to 1 p.m. And the commissioning ceremony will start at 12.50 specifically. Um, I'm not sure if that is open to the public itself, but there is a media advisory, so I'm guessing it probably would be for people who would be a uh, who are uh, part of the Navy who happen to be in the area who would like uh, to attend. Uh, that will be going on at, uh, according to this, uh, Canada.ca at 12.50 p.m. Uh, in uh, at uh, the Burrard Dry Dock Pier, 15 Wallace Mews, North Vancouver, B.C. So there you go. We bring you all the news. <laughs> all right. Also in the news, uh, the un uh, with the protests going on on campus, um, in the States, uh, the right uh, police squad did uh, crack down and uh, broke it all up. Uh, it seems that now, there, yesterday we had reported that over 1,000 people had been arrested across the United States for protests. That is, numbers crossed over 2,000 now. Um and uh, for the University of Toronto, uh, they issued a statement ordering that the demonstrators dispersed by 10 p.m. last night, but then kind of revised it later on, saying that if activities remained peaceful, it would not be dismantled, uh, stating specifically that hate speech and threats would not be considered as peaceful protest. Um, some people are making the point with regard to uh, to some of these protests that uh, in a world and in a demographic uh, that speaks often of microaggressions, uh, there seems to be a little disconnect with uh, being sensitive to microaggressions in certain areas of life and uh, being completely okay with uh, chanting things uh, about certain nations needing to be ended. Um, that's a little dis. You know, we do not know why you're doing this, why mm. you feel it's appropriate in this case uh, to be doing this, because this is, uh, you know, um, protesting that an entire um, country should be wiped away or something like that is right. a little more than a microaggression. 
I would say. So not being able to understand how um, students who happen to be Jewish might be a little uncomfortable. A little, a little bit. Uh, with those types of uh, songs and chants and slogans. Seems... <sighs> seems that there's some there might be some willful not willing to put yourself in other people's shoes here in this case um but hopefully um the thing with dismantling these things is that uh, it's very easy to for people to say you know crack some heads send them in but as we mentioned, sometimes when you dismantle, you bring more attention and you invite more people eventually. And if you break it up in one spot, then nothing stops that group from splintering and starting up in like three or four other spots, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're just moving around putting out fires. So going in with force and dismantling is probably not the most effective way. It probably clear the issue for a day or two, but it doesn't stop it from popping up elsewhere. It probably requires some actual people talking to each other. One if you want a sustainable situation, violence and force are probably not going to solve it. It's going to feel good in the moment for those who are frustrated and whatnot, seeing them. I can hear people at home going, nah, those little fuckers got what they deserved. But, um, Force is not going to solve this issue. Agreed. So, um, you know, again, the simple solutions usually are not solutions, right? So this is, some things are messy and some things just require time and work. This is probably one of them. So uh, don't get your hopes up that uh, just sending in the police is going to solve this and teach these kids a lesson or something like that because that's not how it works. It just isn't. Uh, in Alberta, there's been some much-needed rain, which has allowed some crews to extinguish a certain number of blazes, including some that have been burning since last year, which is kind of good. Uh, at present, there are 43 wildfires in uh, Alberta. Three are being held, and none are considered out of control at this time last year. Um there were about 100 fires, and roughly one-third of them were out of control, so we're doing a little better right now. But to Wildfire Alberta, uh, Wildfire Alberta, Christy Tucker says, uh, it is still easy for some warm, dry, windy days to raise the wildfire danger level again. We will be responding to conditions to introduce or adapt to fire bans, restrictions, or advisories as appropriate. So uh, please, uh, if you're out there, do remain vigilant, uh, and if you are doing things uh that involve fire in an area that doesn't have a fire ban, please make sure that you take good, good care of your fire. It is very, 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 very well extinguished and uh, that you're not being reckless and that you're not playing around and uh, just, just a little extra caution and care, right? To make sure that uh, you know where your, where your flame and your, your embers are going. So um, because we don't need to, we don't need accidents. Uh, Mother Nature is doing a good job enough oh, yes. on her own. <laughs> it doesn't need any help. Um, some interesting news also Just a second, gonna... Okay, that may not um, make Pee, Pee happy uh, because he's trying to convince us uh, that uh, carbon tax and all of that is killing us. But it uh, seems that despite his efforts to tie inflation to federal carbon pricing, according to the Bank of Governor Tiff Macklem, axing the tax would have no long-term inflationary impact. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, he appeared before the House Finance Committee on Thursday and explained that eliminating federal carbon pricing would likely cause a one-year drop in inflation by 0.7%. And then it would quickly rebound to normal levels, principally because it's something that you could only do once. Once you ax the tax, then what? So, um, <laughs> yeah, while um, PP seems to be wanting to uh, convince the people that all we need to do is ax the tax 
<laughs> and everything will be okay again. Because that is clearly not the point. According to iPolitics, we begin with bad news for Pierre Polyev and his slogans. Despite conservative efforts to tie inflation to carbon pricing, axing the tax would have no long-term inflationary impact, according to Bank of, Governor, Gov Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem. Appearing before the House Finance Committee today, Macklem explained that eliminating federal carbon pricing would likely cause a one-year drop in inflation to 0.7%, but would quickly rebound to normal levels. Quote, if you eliminate the carbon tax, you can only do that once, Macklem told MPs. Quote, inflation would be lower for one year, but it would not be sustainably lower, so I don't think it would have a big impact. Macklem added that the central bank is more concerned with underlying inflationary trends, so removing federal carbon pricing would not facilitate a quicker interest rate cut either. <laughs> Last month, Statistics Canada reported the Consumer Price Index, which measures inflation, was 2.9% in March, just within the Bank of Canada's 1-3% to target range. Macklem said the inflation rate would have remained 2.8% had the government not hiked the carbon price in April, but it still would not have caused the bank to lower its 5% policy rate, which it maintained for the sixth consecutive time last month. The bank's next interest rate decision is slated for June 5th. So um, he keeps on pointing to the parliamentary budget officer saying, yeah, he says you're worse off. And so the parliamentary budget officer says, uh, no, actually, 80% uh, are better off on a cash transfer basis. And then he says, you know, we're doing terribly and nobody wants to invest here. And then, of course, Canada has the third highest foreign direct investment. He says, we have a crisis. And then you have, if you, you have Kevin Page, the former parliamentary budget officer, going, there is no crisis right <laughs> and then you have uh, tiff macklem uh you have pierre paul you have going so that all we need to do is axe the tax and then you've got tiff macklem goes yeah, yeah you cut inflation by 0 0.7 percent one year and then <laughs> so um i think i'm starting to know why pierre Polyev doesn't like experts yeah well. they keep on pointing out how his plans are crap you know, <laughs> he wants common people to be the experts. He also wants common people to determine whether or not his laws are constitutional. That's an invitation to mob rule. I'm just saying. Um, so, yeah, not getting good news, PP is these days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other bad news that he's not getting is that uh, Canada's emissions dropped to the lowest, lowest point in 25 years, barring pandemic lows. Canada's 2024 National Inventory Report confirms that we have bent the curve and emissions remain on a long-term downward track while we grow a clean, sustainable, and strong economy. Canada accounts for nearly 1.5% of global green gas, greenhouse gas emissions, making it the 11th largest emitter in the world. However, Canada ranks 37th by population among countries in the world, comprising about 0.5% of the world's total, with more than 40.7 million Canadians, according to this article, of course. Um, so this is very, very good news because mm. uh, it does confirm what we saw before um, and what we've been told uh, that we have uh, bent the curve. So we've basically recovered from uh, 10 years of Harper doing sweet fuck all. Yes. And we are starting to now uh, see some actual real, uh, real reductions. Um, According to Environment, Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo, the hard work by Canadians to reduce emissions is paying off. Uh, the emissions were a little lower in the year, first two years of the pandemic because, of course, there was lower activity uh, overall. But in a full, like, you know, sort of normal economy year, this is uh, the lowest that has been ever recorded. Uh, the oil and gas sector alone contributed to 217 megatons, or 31% of Canada's emissions. Transportation was the second most polluting sector, with 5, 156 megatons, or 22% of Canada's emissions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, with uh, more electric vehicles, that's going to go down. And the oil and gas sector, which has been pretty much spared so far from having to do anything serious at all uh well it's showing it's showing that relying on them to uh do it voluntarily is not really working right Apparently. they're still the biggest and and by a lot uh 
Buildings accounted for 89 metric tons or 13%. And again, we're dealing with that with renovations and heat pumps and all that kind of stuff and changes in building codes. While heavy industry and agriculture accounted for 78 megatons, 11%. And again, we're doing things, you know, for example, the University of Guelph has a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful research department uh, when they're studying agriculture and that kind of stuff. And I'm sure there's some uh, universities out west that also have that. And uh, there are new farming techniques and, uh, you know, technology is being brought to uh, the aid of farmers now to do, be able to manage water and other types of resources to help them as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, heavy industry is 78 megatons, 11%, and agriculture 70 percent, uh, 70 megatons for 10%. So Canada's emissions in 2022 were lower by 44 megatons than Canada's pre-pandemic 2019 levels. So 44 megatons is not negligible. No. At all. Ebo- uh, Gilbo told reporters that Canada's 2022 emissions of 708 megatons are the lowest they have been in 25 years, with the exception of the first two years of the COVID pandemic when the sudden global economic slowdown caused emissions to drop sharply. Canada's emissions saw a decrease of 54 megatons compared with the 2005 base year for Canada's 2030 GHG emissions redu- reductions target. So uh, when they say, you know, how much, per, what, what below, how much below we are 2030, when they always give a number below 2030, below 2050, below whatever, mm-hmm. like this. So that's uh, the one that we are using. This ours is 2005. So we're 54 megatons lower uh, in terms of production than we were in 2005, and that's with this much more population. I'm not sure what the population was in 2005. So that's even accounting for population growth. We are still reducing, and economic growth. We are reducing. Uh, so 7% reduced uh, from 2005. The Government of Canada has invested over $120 billion to support provinces and territories, Indigenous communities, businesses, and Canadians in the pursuit of a net zero economy, says Gilbo. Canada's 2024 National Inventory Report confirms that we have bent the curve and emissions remain on a long-term down tr- downward track while we grow a clean, sustainable, and strong economy. Uh, Meanwhile, critics say they want to see more action from the big industry emitters. Quote, the electricity sector, small businesses, and heavy industries are working to reduce emissions. Families are doing their best to make climate-friendly choices. It's only fair to hold the country's highest emitting companies accountable for reducing their emissions, said Alex Cool Fergus, National Policy Manager at Climate Action Network Canada. He pointed to the 2023 record wildfire season, along with deadly heat domes and record flooding in recent years, as reasons why climate action must be a top priority. Quote, Canadians have had enough with delays. They want the country's most polluting industry to be held to account. Keith Brooks, Program Director of Environmental Defence Canada, said the oil and gas sector needed to pull its weight. Quote, the electricity sector is the main driver of emissions reductions thanks to the coal phase-out. Canada's oil and gas industry, the country's most polluting polluting industry, is failing to do its part. Any progress in reducing the industry's methane emission has been wiped out by increases in oil and gas production, Brooks argues. Uh, The oil and gas industry has been unwilling to reduce its emissions voluntarily instead of banking on ineffective technology like carbon capture and storage, he said. And on that front, uh, Edmonton-based Capital Power announced on Wednesday that it will not be pursuing a $2.4 billion carbon capture project due to high costs. Mm. When asked about the project's demise Thursday, Gilmo said that carbon capture is, quote, not the be-all and all of fighting for climate change. He noted the report released Thursday shows that carbon capture and storage has contributed to 7 million tons of pollution being sucked out of the atmosphere. It's one of the 150 measures that we're putting in place, and we think that it can play a role. However, environmental defense argued that 7 megatons amounts to around 0.0004%. That's four ten thousandths yeah. of a percent of Canada's emissions since 2004, and it is not a viable solution. Quote, carbon capture is unnecessary, ineffective, and expensive, said Julia Levin, Associate Director at Environmental Defense. The bottom line, most the most effective way to deal with carbon dioxide emissions is to prevent them from ever being created rather than trying to pluck them from the air or smokestacks or inject them in the ground. This is important the latter part of this is important because the conservative mantra on addressing carbon is technology, not taxes. Right. Stephen Harper talked to us about carbon capture. Let's say 
he did it halfway through his mandate instead of at the beginning. Let's mm-hmm. be generous. We have nine years, eight full years of the prime minister, or the current one, and let's say five years of Harper. 13 years ago, if we're being generous, is yes. when carbon capture was mentioned to us. Four ten thousandths. Of yeah, that's, that's, then. that's not a lot. If we had bet it all on technology, like they told us to do then, not only would we had everything that Harper didn't do, mm-hmm. all the gases, but then we'd have everything for what we would have added on since then by not bending the curve and just hoping that someday some technology would just come along. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's were other news lately that the other thing that uh, people are asking us to rely on is on the, the small nuclear reactors. They're saying that's the other thing that they're telling us now, like any moment now. <laughs> They've been saying that for 50 years. Yeah. And there were articles, you know, just not that long ago, a couple of weeks ago saying again, it's, you know, like, yeah, those are not also, those, those are also aren't happening as fast as uh, originally thought. So again, the two technologies that they keep on telling us to uh, rely on and that they've been telling us for a long time to rely on, just wait, you don't, you don't need to do anything to fight climate change because these technologies will take care of it for us. Because again, and I keep on saying, even if those technologies existed, then we'd have to believe that the pro-conservative government would be so gung-ho to actually put the money in making sure that these technologies were distributed throughout the country. Mm-hmm. Because subsidizing that certainly would also be in the best interest of their oil and gas buddies, right? Mm-hmm. There's no guarantee that even if we had the technologies that they would be saying, hey, let's make sure everybody has this. So we can't rely. We can't rely on that whatsoever. Um, it's very important for us to keep on the track that we're, we're on at a minimum and then to keep on adding to that as we can because at the rate that we are going, yes, we are decreasing and it looks like we've bent the curve and it looks like we're on a sustainable long-term track, but there are still some additional measures, the measures that are announced have to be implemented and there's still a couple more that we need to put to put to put in place so that we can actually meet our goal i think we're still a, a couple of megatons uh, off our, our full goal and so we have to find other ways to, yes. to, to reduce in, in that way but i, I um, have i've got something for you here that you th- i think you'll find very interesting sir okay it's on the screen right now may 2nd 2024 these ratings Rating action. Moody's Ratings affirms Canada's AAA rating maintains stable outlook. New York, May 2nd, 2024. Moody's Ratings has today affirmed the Government of Canada's AAA long-term issuer and senior unsecured ratings. The AAA senior unsecured MTN program and self-ratings were also affirmed along with the P1 commercial paper and short-term ratings. The ratings outlook remains stable. And here's the thing. Very high per capita income levels and high competitiveness and Trudeau Trudeau's government's history of and continued focus on maintaining a prudent fiscal policy stance. Mic drop. But again, that's Moody's. They would be the experts in the field. And again, we don't listen to experts. Right. Yes. Evidence. I don't need your damn evidence. (laughs) Bashes. We don't need no stinking bashes. I feel everything is broken. That's what matters. I, I do. Uh, I do have a link. Uh, I posted a link in the chat earlier. Tavi sent me. It was a Tavi. I think Tavi sent me. Somebody sent me. Sorry if I got the name wrong. Because I opening and anyway, doing lots of stuff in the background about the ride program. And let me read this to you because this is interesting. I don't know how old this document is. Let's see if I can find a date on it. Uh, well, let's see. When was this written? I don't know. I don't know. But I'll go back to the thing. Does the ride program for impaired driving violate my charter rights? In a word, no, it does not. Ride checks are legal in and accordance with the charter so long as they are conducted properly. Prima facie, stopping cars at random to check the sobriety of the drivers therein is not constitutional. 
pay attention, mm -hmm. not constitutional. Affecting the stop is a detention, however, however brief. And if there are no criteria for determining who to stop, that is, it is truly random, that detention is arbitrary and in violation of Section 9 of the Charter. However, the provincial legislation authorizing, authorizing such random spot checks was scrutinized by the courts and legislation was upheld. In short, the court determined that though the practice infringed upon the charter rights of the drivers to be free from arbitrary detention, that this was a reasonable limit within the meaning of Section 1 of the Charter. Bottom line, ride stops are constitutional, so you must comply with them. Okay, so I had it wrong. Hmm. But it's it's but, it's like it's a thin razor's edge. But you're right, prima facie. Right. On its face, which which means legal speaks so on its face, it is. Correct. So I wasn't entirely wrong. Yes. I wasn't entirely right. Hmm. But I do remember that when when Margaret Trudeau was stopped in a, a ride program a number of years ago, it was ruled as unconstitutional. Uh, I don't remember all the details. That's got to be 25 years ago. 20, 25 years, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was a precedent setting case. Uh, and a lot of people got freaked out by it. But I'm like, well, you also have to remember there was cases in the past that set things up so that if I was hosting a party, somebody showed up and got drunk that on the alcohol I served them and got into an accident, somebody was severely hurt or maimed or killed, I would be held responsible. But they didn't delineate that if somebody showed up to your house, brought their own liquor or showed up intoxicated, brought their own liquor. You didn't serve them anything. And then they drove away and, and something occurred. They were still holding the person who held the party responsible. Mm -hmm. I know this because this case that, so that, that, that law changed to a degree after that, because there was a woman I used to work with who had held a New Year's Eve party took everybody's keys when they got there, Who uh, anybody who wanted to drink. They had set up mattresses and sleeping bags so people could stay. One guy showed up. They did not serve, they didn't serve alcohol. It was a BYOB, right? Mm -hmm. One guy showed up who had been, I, th I think he had about a dozen impaired charges against him, DUIs. Showed up and they didn't serve him. They tried to stop him from leaving. He left. And he ended up uh, hitting a car head on. Uh, there was a, a young couple. The driver, the, the young man, was killed. The woman is uh, now a wheelchair user. And they tried to sue this couple that hosted the party. And the lawyer, the defense lawyer, said, uh, this case is complex and convoluted and we need to look at things here because if this goes ahead, if this couple gets sued successfully by the plaintiff it will now come to the fact that nobody can ever host a party ever again anywhere at any time because if anything happens now it's on you and like we have admonished personal responsibility for anything and we're blaming somebody else and i'm like i feel terrible for that young couple a young man lost his life a young woman is now a wheelchair user through no fault of her own Mm -hmm. but the couple who hosted the party did not serve that man alcohol. They tried to make him stay and he left. Now they can't hold him down legally, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the whole, there's a whole bunch of precedents set around that case. And the big concern was, so basically you have no, you're no longer personally responsible for any, any of your own actions was what it boiled down to. So it was a really scary case. And that was about, goodness, 20, 25 years ago, something like that. Mm. I think it was 99. Yeah, I think it was a, yeah, it was 99. It was going into the year 2000, that, okay. that New Year's Eve. Oh, interesting. They took every wow. precaution and then this woman tried to sue them. And I'm like, whoa, like, eesh. Because okay. I, I didn't hear about that second part. I knew about the first part when, when, when hosts were were now considered liable, but yes. I haven't heard about the second case. Oh, yeah. interesting. And, and I don't know how, how it all breaks down in the end, right? It's like, what happened to personal responsibility? Right, right, right. And um, they didn't serve him alcohol. He showed up intoxicated. Oh, yeah. He had his own alcohol. He had a, a, 
a pint or a Mickey or a, uh, a flask. And then he left. They tried to stop him. They didn't. It, they, a matter of fact, I think when you walked in, you had to turn your keys in. Well, he had another set of keys. <laughs> Jeez. I, I can't remember all the details. This is like 25 years ago. But I do remember when it happened. And, and that lawyers were like this. Uh, uh, mm. You know. Yeah. And you're yeah. right, Jay. Don't drink and drive should be obvious by now. I think it is for most people. Uh, but when, you're, when your judgment is impaired, people make stupid mistakes and, and bad choices. And look what comes out of it, right? So it was a tragic, uh, a tragic thing that took place. A woman lost um, her, her partner and, you know, altered her life forever. And, right. and the couple, I remember what the couple was going through because I used to work with this woman. And she's like, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. Like this will, this will bankrupt us. We'll lose our house. We'll lose our business. We didn't do anything wrong here. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Um, in, um, some, uh, other military news that I had forgot to mention when it was talking about, uh, the, the ship, the vessel, um, there are changes being brought to key programs uh, that will affect how Canadian fighter pilots and soldiers being deployed to NATO-led missions uh, will be prepared. Uh, troops headed to Latvia because we're coordinating a mission there will no longer be combined arms training at CFB Wainwright in Alberta. They will now be training at their home bases and they will do combined drills with allies in Latvia. Uh, the Air Force has also announced that it will retire its fleet of training jets and will be asking allies to do final staged fixed wing instruction. The Chief of Defense Staff, Wayne Ayer, says that the changes will not lead to lower quality troops or pilots. In the case of the Army, he says that it is merely returning to a Cold War regimen where troops go to Europe and train where it is that they are going to fight. Uh, former Commander Andrew Leslie uh, has come out in public against uh, the idea, and um, some of the pilots uh, are concerned uh, about uh, the change in the training because the Allied programs uh, tend to be a little more generic mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in some of their opinion. Uh, but according to the Chief of Defense Staff, um, this is uh, going to be uh, a better way of doing things, and it also takes into account the fact that even though uh, military spending is going up, that there was still an exercise uh, within the federal government to try and uh, cut uh, a certain amount from what was already existing uh, to try and be a little more efficient in order to make room for some of the new spending. And that's uh, what has motivated some of these decisions here. Mm. So uh, just there. Uh, speaking about... Um, things military, uh, but not involving Canada. Uh, when we're talking about Israel and Gaza, there's been a couple of developments. Uh, it seems that uh, the um, uh, makeshift pier that uh, was talked about about a month ago that the United States said that they were going to build to try and get more aid is going to be uh, somewhat operational uh, as soon as this weekend, if everything goes well. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to, um, it means that they'll be able to maybe uh, start offloading some supplies off ships and onto uh, whatever the dock will be or the port will be. Uh, but that doesn't mean it still gets onshore and gets distributed yet. Um, but at least there will be that. It also seems that uh, there might have been another crossing on the north uh, that has been open. There isn't a lot of details about that. Uh, and uh, at other crossings, it seems that trucks are uh, moving with a steady flow. Um, but uh, it's still the case that um, the Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, wants more of it. He says that there's definite progress being made in delivering the humanitarian aid, but the aid needs to be um, sustained and it needs mm -hmm. to be accelerated. So his quote is, the progress is real, but given the real need, given the immensity in Gaza, it needs to be accelerated, it needs to be sustained. Uh, so more crossings of trucks by land, the USC terminal will be oper operational, still challenges to delivering the aid. Uh, it seems that uh, there might be some Israeli settlers that are interfering with the process 
of uh, trucks getting to where they need to go with the checkpoints and uh, that uh, even a couple of supplies uh, have been destroyed. Um, Secretary of State Blinken reiterated that the United States does not support a plan from Israel to invade Rafa without there being a plan to protect civilians. On that front, there is, seems to be some negotiations that seem to be a little more serious going on with regard to a ceasefire. It seems that Hamas has sent out uh, an offer saying that uh, they would be willing to lay down arms, which is new, if Israel still met a whole bunch of conditions that are pretty much poison pill. Uh, so it's... Before it was just sort of like the poison pill conditions, but no offer to lay down arms. But this one comes with an offer to lay down arms, so it has to be taken seriously, even though the conditions seem like poison pill uh, because it's new. Mm -hmm. uh, and you wouldn't be slipping it in, in, in there. That's supposed to be sending a, a signal of some kind. Uh, it nice. seems that Israel has made an offer uh, that Hamas is... Uh, there. They're waiting for Hamas to hear, uh, to, to respond to. Uh, from what I can tell from the news, Hamas hasn't responded completely favorably to it as well. But they are talking back and forth and trying to negotiate. So hopefully uh, this, uh, this could happen. Uh, there's still some talk about uh, maybe about 40 hostages being released, uh, having something to do with that as well. Uh, meanwhile, uh, certain nations are taking bigger steps. Uh, Belize and Bolivia had already done this last year, but uh, the nation of Colombia, its president, Gustavo Petro, has uh, severed ties with Israel completely. Uh, this is pretty significant because uh, Colombia is a nation that does uh, depend on Israel for military hardware such as machine guns and fighter jets. Um, Pedro had already heavily criticized Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and requested to join South Africa's case, including is accusing Israel of genocide at the International Court of Justice. We talked about this earlier. Uh, this uh, Right now, uh, th these details are from Reuters. Uh, and he is quoted as saying, Here in front of you, the government of change of the President of the Republic announces that tomorrow we will break diplomatic relations with the State of Israel for having a government, for having a president who is genocidal, Petro told Shering Crowns in Bogota, who marched to mark International Workers' Day and back Petro's social and economic reforms. Um, Countries cannot be passive in face of the events in Gaza, he added. He is... Uh, quoted as saying, the extermination of an entire people cannot happen while we look away. If Palestine dies, humanity dies. Um, Bolivia, as we mentioned, broke relations with Israel at the end of October last year, while seven other countries in Latin America, including uh, Chile and Honduras, have recalled their ambassadors. So did Colombia uh, on that. Um, so um, the Netanyahu government has responded that uh, Petro is a Hamas supporter and anti-Semite. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, but Colombia is doing this despite the fact uh, that there is some opposition internally because they rely on Israel uh, for, for uh, you know, their military and uh, defense purchases. So uh, this is a, you know, it's a small nation, uh, but it is putting somewhat its money where its mouth is behind its principles because, I mean, you know, national defense is kind of a big thing and when you're criticizing your own supplier. Um that that's that's not an empty gesture. Uh, at the same time, uh, it seems that today uh, Turkey has suspended all trade with Israel over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, saying imports and exports will resume only when Israel allows an uninterrupted and significant flow of aid into Gaza, which hopefully is happening now with the pier and the more open crossings. Israel's foreign minister accused Erdogan of acting like a dictator. So uh, one country says they're supporting ties. You're a Hamas supporter and anti-Semite. Another country says we're severing ties. You're a dictator. Now, in case of Erdogan, that part is kind of true. But <laughs> so 
but apparently last year between Tur- trade between uh, Turkey and Israel was uh, valued at $7 billion. So there again, uh, a nation putting its money where its mouth is. Uh, so these are not uh, insignificant decisions on the world stage. Um, take it for uh, what it's worth, but uh, that along with uh, uh, the campus movement encouraging uh, universities and post-secondary institutions to divest, uh, there is uh, more and more and more pressure on uh, the Netanyahu government, and it appears that the Netanyahu government has made a commitment to the government of the United States that it will not do anything whatsoever with regard to a ground invasion of Rafah without first discussing it with the United States. Uh, so there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more buffer uh, than there was before because a couple of weeks ago uh, you had Netanyahu uh, going all over the press saying that a date had been chosen. Of course, he was contradicted by someone in his war cabinet a couple of days later. But, um, yeah. So we've gone from the date has been set, it is happening to nothing will happen before we first discuss it with the United States, and we will first discuss with the United States. So we're getting maybe a little, a couple of steps further away from uh, that invasion. Uh, we can only hope. So I um, just gave you a very brief tour of the Polly's World Studio A lounge. Bar and lounge. <laughs> I thought it would be a cute thing to do. It didn't work out the, exactly the way I wanted it to. Uh, so what, what, what has taken place here in the studio? I uh, took an old TV that I've had and mounted it on the wall. And then a bar my dad built in 1977 when we lived in Gander, Newfoundland. So it's a very 70s bar. Very 70s. Which I love it. It's awesome. And uh, he had to trim it down a few years back to make it fit down the stairwell to the house they live in now. And when he did... It is now the perfect size for the space where the studio used to be. So we now have a bar there. <laughs> and it, it's really cool. We sat there, Bridget and I sat there last night at the bar watching the hockey game. Eating chips, watching the game. Having, having by the way, she picked up um, uh, Selection, which is a Metro brand. You know, Metro, the grocery store which I think is only available in Eastern Ontario. I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, but they, they, there's a brand of blonde ale, non-alcoholic blonde ale that they have. Mm-hmm. It's nine fifty for 12, 355 mil cans. So it's a bargain. Believe me, it's a bargain. And it's great. It is so good. I was like, this, this tastes like a real beer. And there's no alcohol in it. So we sat there having... having non-alcoholic beer watching a hockey game. It was, it was glorious. It was glorious. Ah, love it. So yeah, love it. my little sojourn. I had to go take care of something. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'll do this at the same time for fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm uh, sending you a, a little clip, uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, because, um, a kit, asked me a couple of days ago, I wonder what Elizabeth May had to say oh, with regards yes. to uh, stuff that was going on in the House of Commons, and I was able to find a little something. Um, so uh, this is just a clip from uh, Primetime Politics on CPAC um, that has a little bit of what uh, Jagmeet, had to, Jagmeet Singh had to say, and then uh, uh, Green Party uh, leader Elizabeth May, because... Uh, in all the brouhaha, they didn't actually get much uh, profile. No. So let's, uh, give me a sec here. I'll, I'll, I'll set it up. She, look at my, my silly dog is lying behind my chair. <laughs> no, no, sec. She's lying behind my chair. I don't know what is going on with her right now. And I'll put this on the screen so you can see her. Can you see it? Uh, it's not working. Things are not, there we go. It's like literally lying behind the chair. I don't know what it's... A second ago, oh. she was in the tight corner. Now she's behind the chair. You see, she's slob- slobbered all over the green screen there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she has decided point. that you are you are not going anywhere. Exactly. So let me let me bring this up. So this is sort of the tail end, and then we'll, we'll hear it. 
a coward, not someone who's willing to accept responsibility for their actions. I've been pleading with friends on all sides of the house to pull back from taking this degree of deep partisanship and really dangerous levels of escalation of partisanship on all sides to pull back, to step up, and to do what Canadians expect of us. And a quick... All right. So there you go. The stateswoman. Yes. Essentially. Um, now, if you uh, keep that uh, thing and uh, go to uh, 1324, uh, Mr. Grisley, um, the episode of uh, Prime Time Politics of uh, May 1st had an interesting interview with uh, Danielle Smith because uh, May 1st, uh, Kids and Cubs, was the day, was May Day, yes, indeed it was, but it was also the day that uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline went into operation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cost greater, 30, greater than $34 billion. It will allow to transport over greater than a thousand kilometers, about three times more petrol from Alberta to the British Columbia coast with a capacity that goes from 300,000 to 890,000, sorry, 890,000 barrels per day. Yvonne Klusch, an energy specialist at the University of Montreal, says, quote, this will change everything for Alberta. We must remember that Canadian petrol sells for much cheaper on the international market because both buyers and Americans know that Canadians can't sell their product to any nation other than the United States. So the product is sold at a discount. Now they will be able to sell on global markets. Therefore, we expect a significant rise in the price per barrel sold by Canadian operators. It will also be favorable for the Canadian economy. So great stuff, right? Um, we have yep, that's me you're probably wondering how i ended up in this situation what well to canada's energy sector now as today is a big day the long-awaited trans mountain expansion began operating the 1000 kilometer pipeline running from edmonton to Burnaby in British Columbia. Now, the feds bought the pipeline from Kinder Morgan in 2018. This was to ensure the project happened. And despite some delays, some cost overruns, here we are. And to talk about it, we're joined by the Alberta Premier, Danielle Smith. Premier, thank you for joining us again. My pleasure. Now, you're on record as saying that today's development is a game changer. What do you mean by that? In a couple of different ways. I mean, um, at the political level, one of the things that we should have confidence in is that Canada can complete major, large industrial nation building projects. I think that should give us some encouragement. It also shows that you can have federal provincial cooperation in even different political parties pushing towards the same goal. I mean, I think that that also should give some investor confidence. But from a dollars and cents point of view, this increases our ability to export Canadian crude internationally, which will allow us to get new customers, which will allow us to get better prices. That not only helps Alberta, but it also helps the, the, the federal government as well with the extra corporate and personal income taxes they'll be able to generate. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by the fact that, that uh, First Oil is beginning to run through that line. Okay, I'm going to get to, to the, the, the cooperation a little bit later. But, you know, on this point of celebrating this official start, you know, as I noted, there were some cost overruns here. It took longer to build than initially thought. And as a result, oil companies who, who want to use TMX will be charged uh, tolls that, they, that I guess are higher than what they want to pay. Will that affect the success of the pipeline and the economic benefits that you're pointing to? think so. I mean, I've seen some economic analysis that suggests that there's about 80% of the pipeline that is currently debt financed, and that will continue. And the uh, tolls that are going to be paid will pay the majority of that debt off. And then in, the, in addition to that, there'll be an, an equity stake. Ultimately, when the government sells it, there'll be a smaller portion that goes into uh, share purchase. And I, I hope they're able to get a First Nation equity partnership. I think that would be really important. So I think the first step is that uh, it looks to me like taxpayers will not be on the hook for this. And I think that's important in order to have public support for this major project. But secondly, yes, the tolls are going to be a bit, little bit higher. But guess what? The amount of dollars that the, uh, that the companies uh, are going to be able to get from the higher sale 
price of, of the oil is going to be important too. I, I've heard, when you look at what has happened in Canada, because we only had one customer, the United States, whenever we got bottlenecked, our oil prices would, would, uh, would shrink. So we would go down and have a difference of about, I think it got to as high as $40 below Western West Texas Intermediate. That differential is now narrowed and it's going to continue to narrow. So they'll be able to, to sell their product at a much higher price than they were able to with only having one, cust one customer, the American. So I would say, yeah, maybe the tolls are a little bit higher, but in the end, I think it's going to be worth it for everyone. It's a win all around. Okay. Now, of course, you, you pointed to the government cooperation that allowed this pipeline to actually, the expansion of it to actually be completed. And, and you know, the federal government as, is being criticized, has been criticized for investing in TMX despite pursuing, you know, an environmental program on the other side. You thanked Justin Trudeau for getting this project done. Does that mean you appreciate the kind of a political tightrope that the prime minister has to walk on the issue between oil development and the environment? It's quite remarkable, really, because the, the federal government, even though they, they've been perceived as being anti-pipeline, they have also produced, uh, they've also uh, permitted and seen two pipelines get built under their watch. So not just this one, but also the uh, the coastal gas link, which I think points to a pragmatism that uh, that understands that as a, an international energy producer with international importance, we've got to make sure that we're supporting our friends and neighbors and allies. And that became even more important in the last several years. So I, I appreciate the pragmatism. It can't have been easy to navigate the constant increases in demand for the, to fund this project through the through the uh, the finance ministry. And the, the fact that they stuck with it and got it to the finish line, I think, is important. No one could have known when this started back in 2013 that it couldn't get done without the federal government buying it. No one could have known when they took it over that we would end up with the, the war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as all of the turmoil in the Middle East. But I, I think it, it is demonstrating why it is Canada needs to be an important partner and player on the international scene. So I, I hope people understand that uh, the, the, the world does need more Canada and that this is a, a very encouraging project and we should do more of them. So okay. Who is that woman really and what did she do with Danielle Smith? She must have had a really hard time with that one. <laughs> Well, we want to thank the federal government. Oh, you know, she was just gritting her teeth on that one, right? Who was that woman and what did she do with Danielle Smith? She actually <sighs> said, like, the partnership was good. Thankful. She said, hey, by the way, they didn't just build Trans Mountain. There was this other thing that they also did. She proactive. Yeah. Who is this woman? The tolls will be hard. Oh, yeah, but that's okay. They'll, they'll be getting more money. For when it benefits oh. her directly, she'll praise him. If so he does again, something for a municipality that she thinks she should have her fingers in that pie of money, she gets mad at him and changes the laws in the province so that the, the sitting uh, provincial legislature now can override a municipality because the federal government's dealing directly with the municipality. That's bad. But if it benefits her oil baron overlords who pull her puppet strings, that's good. Yeah. Tell me I'm wrong on that. Tell me I'm wrong on that. I mean, please, somebody, if you can tell me I'm wrong about that, I will admit it. I will, mea culpa, I'm wrong. You did it, you got it, but no, I'm not. You know I'm not. You know I'm not wrong on that. Yeah. Then she goes on, the interview does go on, and then she sort of gets, goes back more into sort of like normal Danielle yeah. sort of territory there. Um that point, like, for example, you know, what do you say to environmentalists? You know, well, you know, India is already interested in buying oil and, well, you know, if we supply it, if we replace with ours, you know, well, like this. And, hey, listen, don't get me wrong. There is something that is true to the fact that if you displace dirtier sources of fuel and energy somewhere else in the world with something that is cleaner, not cleanest, but cleaner, every little bit helps. Yes. Like this. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that the government of Alberta keeps on saying that we should get the credit for supplying and that it should not be the credit of the country of making the decision to buy, <laughs> to switch away from something dirtier to something that is still dirty, but maybe cleaner than what they were using before to at least move, you know, move the ball forward mm -hmm. a little bit that we should be getting the credit and not the country that decided to actually, you know, take the initiative to make that change. That's, that's where we get to the BS, right? Um, so, but it was just, I was like, oh my God, 
like this week, we saw that PP is able to be, behave like a normal, decent human who actually tells the truth for the most part. Danielle Smith is as well. So they just choose not to. They choose not to. It's Most a of the time. They clearly have it within them. Yes. Now, speaking of her, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. she posted something uh, the other day that uh, may not be um, exactly, oh, um, what's the word? Um, um, uh, true. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly, if you would. Oh, One he is munching. Sorry. Yesterday, Calgary City Council voted to allow non-citizens to cast ballots in civic elections. In my mind, only Canadian citizens should be able to vote in federal, provincial, and municipal elections. Although we welcome people from around the world to work and live in Alberta, in order to vote, one must commit to Canadian citizenship. That's how it works. I applaud Minister of Municipal Affairs Rick McIver for taking action to ensure integrity in our democratic institutions. Okay. So I read this the other day, not knowing what this was about at all. And I read this and I said, wait a minute, a city council has the power to allow non-citizens to cast ballots in the civic election? That can't be right. That can't be right. And well, since I know that Danielle Smith usually always first chooses to lie, my first thing was like, how did she torque this one? Wow. Do tell. Do tell. According to Please. the Calgary Herald uh, by Scott Strasser. Mm-hmm. Mm. A Calgary councillor's push to allow permanent residents to vote to municipal elections was approved by council on Tuesday. But while the motion passed in a 9-6 vote, one councillor called the decision to lobby the province to make the change an exercise in futility, considering a UCP minister has flatly stated the government has no interest in the move. While city council does not have the power to extend voting rights, it will forward a resolution to Alberta's municipal to Alberta Muniz's next annual conference in September as an advocacy item. If it has supports there, Alberta Muniz, which advocates on behalf of 265 member municipalities of the province, would lobby the government to amend the Local Authorities Election Act to expand voter eligibility to include individuals who are not Canadian citizens but have been granted permanent resident status. Currently, Section 47 of the LAEA states that to participate in a municipal election, voters must be at least 18 years old, a Canadian citizen, and reside permanently in Alberta. Ward 8 Councillor Courtney Walcott, who introduced the motion Tuesday, said permanent residents deserve the right to vote in municipal elections, considering many pay property taxes, use city services, and contribute to the vitality of the municipality. He said the motion is strictly focused on municipal elections and the LAEA and does not seek to amend provincial or federal voting rights. The big question is what do we do here? When you're thinking about what a province does and what a federal government does, there are a lot of reasons to why you would want to limit the voting rights at at that level to a particular citizenship. But at the local level, what do we do? We create community. Councillors Dan McLean, Jennifer Weissness, Sean Chu, Peter DeMong, Sonia Sharp, and Andre Shabbat voted against the motion. A common theme among the opposing councillors was that achieving the right to vote is an incentive for permanent residents to pursue citizenship. Sharp said her mother was a permanent resident for 30 years and was incredibly proud when she was finally able to vote. Wynas noted that Alberta Municipal Affairs Minister Rick Iver, McIver has already waded into the debate by stating the province will not entertain amending the LAEA to extend voting rights. She also asked Walcott to explain how the extension of voting rights would avoid creating a tiered system in municipal government as allowing non-citizens the right to vote would also grant them the ability to run for office. Quote, does that mean if anyone pays any tax in Calgary, such as the tourist tax, they get to vote? She asked disingenuously. It's an interesting argument, but we have to ask, where is the threshold? I'm pretty sure that we're talking about property taxes. Pretty sure. Yeah. Ward 10 Councillor André Chabot uh, agrees with Whiteness calling the proposal an exercise in futility, considering McIver's earlier statement. Ward 11 Councillor Courtney Penner said permanent residents technically are protected under the Charts of rights, Charters of Rights and Freedoms and noted that at one point women were not allowed to vote. She said the motion would start a conversation about challenging the status quo. Quote, if we're afraid to have a conversation about how things could change, that's more worrisome to me than any potential outcome, she said. 
Walcott said taxation without representation was one of the fundamental arguments around the creation of North American countries. He also referenced the ongoing public hearing around blanket rezoning, added that last week, councillors listened to the perspectives from both citizens and non-citizens on the matter. This is a conversation around, are we going to talk about our values, about who we represent? On Wednesday, McIver reiterated that the provincial government has no intention of amending voters' rights to include permanent residents. Quote, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms affirms the right of every Canadian citizen to vote and to run as a candidate, he said. This right extends to voters in municipal, provincial, and federal elections. Protecting our democracy is the utmost importance. Our provincial election legislation, like the Local Authority Elections Act, has also been clear since its inception that voting is a right of Canadian citizens. Our government will continue to protect the integrity of our elections and make sure voting is accessible for all Albertans who are Canadian citizens. Now, I can see the for and against. Mm-hmm on this one on municipal elections you know you live in a city you bought property you probably you know you pay municipal taxes you should have a say no taxation without representation also i do agree with the point that for example you know the difference between a permanent resident and a canadian citizen is indeed that you have the right to run for office and you know and uh and vote and it is an incentive to make the step to to go to citizenship so um, I have no uh, dog in this hunt one way or the other. Uh, personally, I would be okay either way uh, because it's not everybody here. It's not, you know, it's permanent permanent status, permanent mm-hmm. residence, right? It's not just, hey, if you happen to be in town and you pay the tourist tax and there's an election going on this week, hey, vote, right? <laughs> Which would kind of make it seem. But here it goes. Yesterday, Calgary City Council voted to allow non-citizens to cast ballots in civic elections. Makes it seem that the power was all with them and that they passed that. But that's not exactly what happened. Calgary City Council voted to forward a resolution to Alberta Municipalities' next annual conference in September as an advocacy item for permanent residents to vote in civic elections. Not exactly the same thing. No, no. In her version of what they voted on, um, a couple of things got omitted. <laughs> to kind of make it seem like Calgary City Council, who's led by that dark lady, decided to pass a special law to allow other dark ladies who are not citizens to vote. And we need to fear those dark ladies. I'm just saying. Now, maybe it's because I'm a dark beaver that I'm hearing the dark comments. Maybe. That weren't said. But there seems to be a particular hate on from a certain demographic in Alberta for the mayor of Calgary. And it pushed to actually have her removed. And then she decided, uh, Alberta, Alberta Smith or Saboteur Sabotage Smith decided, well, <laughs> she doesn't like the fact that there's a brown lady and a brown man in both Calgary and Edmonton in the mayor's position so that uh, she's going to be the mayor now. That's what it boils down to. And now all of a sudden there's the claim from the premier that the brown lady mayor actually voted and that this passed creating the impression that in the next municipal election non-citizens particularly brown ones Mm -hmm. might be voting we know what this is we know what this is just it's, it is what it is. it's exactly what it is just trying to refrain from using the term I, yeah yeah i'm rolling my tongue in my mouth <laughs> too because yeah um i have some choice words oh yes i have some choice words danielle um more um another development uh, on the campus protests that i forgot to mention earlier kids and cubs uh there was a a bid to try and remove pro, um, 
an injunction to they tried to get a people tried to get an injunction to uh, remove some of the anti-war protesters from the grounds of McGill. But Quebec's Superior Court Justice Chantal Mass rejected the request, uh, stating that uh, the applicants didn't demonstrate an emergency requiring the intervention of the court. But it did caution the protesters to be mindful of their language and to avoid anything that could be interpreted as a call to violence or anti-Semitism. Um, well, the police, uh, Miguel has asked police assistance in order to get the protesters to leave, but at present, uh, they are still there. Um, yeah, it's just, mm, I, I saw the go last night, the law is the law, and it must, it must be obeyed. I have a, a thing here I want to show you and share with you in a minute, which is completely off topic. I, I would run the breaking news thing, but this happened two days ago. Yeah. But I've, on, I've only just learned about it right now. Okay. Uh, like literally right now. Uh, this is in Indonesia where a volcano erupted and Ooh. we have some footage. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Largest eruption in over 30 years. <laughs> it's on a remote <laughs> island. There was tsunami warnings. People are being evacuated. It's, uh, it's bad. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's massive, huh? Jeez. Yeah, look at this cloud, the ash cloud. That's that huge. is a huge cloud. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me go. I've got a, some uh, stuff here from uh, CNN. It is, let's see, uh, Indonesia volcano eruptions force thousands to evacuate as airlines cancel flights. Um, renewed eruptions from a remote Indonesian volcano have triggered fresh evacuation orders and spike fl uh, sparked, sparked flight cancellations and airport closures this week with smoke, lava, and volcanic gases spewing out of the fiery mountain. Mount Ruang, a 725-meter high or 2,400 feet uh, volcano on Ruang Island, North Sulawesi, has been erupting in spectacular fashion on and off since mid-April. Posing a growing threat to those living nearby and to air traffic in the region, the volcano erupted three times on Tuesday, sending lava and ash clouds into the sky and, and prompting Indonesia's national PVMBG volcanology, volcanology agency to issue its highest alert, warning that a tsunami could be triggered by volcanic material collapsing into the ocean. Ruang lies just off the coast of the larger... Teglandang, I hope I said that right, island where authorities have called on more than 12,000 people to evacuate, according to Reuters. Wow. That is, uh, oh, oh, I've got some footage here. Um, let's see if I, yeah, I'll see if I can put this on the screen for you. Just okay. give me a sec here. I've got all kinds of stuff that just, uh, just dragged over for some reason. <laughs> I got weird stuff happening here. Uh, let me just share this screen and I'll show you the, oops, share this tab. Okay. And boom, this is from CNN. It's about two minutes and 29 seconds, but I think it's important to show this because, you know, it's. Global. The Ruang volcano is still erupting days after it began spewing ash and lava on Tuesday. Have a look at the video and you can see lightning wrapped wow. in massive plumes of smoke and ash as they shoot skywards. Scientists are afraid the crater could eventually collapse and trigger a tsunami in the days ahead. I've never seen anything like that before. Billowing plumes of smoke and ash darken the skies above an Indonesian island. Authorities ordered hundreds of people to evacuate Wednesday after a series of volcanic eruptions. The alert level now at maximum as the volcano's possible collapse into the water threatens to trigger a tsunami like it did in 1871 which produced 25 meter waves according to the u.s national oceanic and atmospheric administration 725 meter mount ruang sits on ruang island in north sulawesi in indonesia since Tuesday night, its multiple eruptions have sent hot clouds almost two kilometers into the sky, according to the country's volcanology agency, while glowing lava flows. Last night at seven o'clock, there was a mixture of fire and rocks erupting, causing the roofs of residences' houses to leak. Lava flowed down from various directions. Ruang Island's roughly 800 residents have evacuated to nearby Tagulangdang Island. But officials warn that even there, 
villages face threats from falling red-hot rocks, hot cloud surges and possible tsunamis. Last night, local people were evacuating themselves sporadically because of small rocks coming down from the eruption. People were panicked and scrambled. Transport officials shut down Sam Ratulangi International Airport more than 100 kilometers from the volcano. Some airlines cancelled flights to nine airports in the region. The showers of ash threatening flight safety and stranding passengers. We had already loaded our luggage and checked in our belongings, and we waited for about an hour, only to be informed that our flight was cancelled due to the eruption of Mount Ruang and Minato was affected. But as long as Mount Ruang continues to erupt, threats of hot smoke, lava, falling rocks and tsunamis remain. Wow. Wow. Gee. I'm, I'm surprised I hadn't heard anything about that because usually we get an announcement of like relief or help or maybe it's too or too early. But the first I heard of it and it was uh, yeah. uh, Tavi G. Thank you for sending that to me because that's yeah. the first I'd heard of it. I'm like, why was this not on a bigger news story? Yeah. yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was yeah. Tavi who sent me that thing about uh, the ride program as well. So thanks, Tavi. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thanks, Tavi. Yeah. Um, Going to quick. Uh, getting a little long there in the show here so we'll yeah, um, just get a, wrap her up, I think. some uh, some tidbits to keep you up to date but to not much development uh it, it's been assessed that uh the bridge in baltimore uh that fell down uh, because it had uh, had a collision uh with a a vessel <laughs> that uh and we saw that uh image as well uh it has been determined that it will take about four years and cost about two billion dollars uh to rebuild so uh there's going to be some uh, disruption uh they had been uh, early on uh, soon after they were able to get some uh, big pieces out to create little navigable ways for smaller uh, vehicles hopefully uh they're doing more, but it is uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, involved uh, extraction uh, projects uh, or initiatives uh, in uh, in U.S. history. So it's it's going to take a while. Um, Donald Trump had Ooh. his uh, what? Oh, this is Ottawa centric. Uh, for those of you who don't know, longtime city councilor Diane Deans enters palliative yes. care. I didn't know about that. Yes, I was going to end with that. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, yes, uh, that's. Uh, I don't have the thing up with me. So, but we will. We will get to that at the end. But she's a city councilor and has been in Ottawa and has been for a very long time. Long time. Um, if you live in Ottawa, Diane Deans is synonymous with Ottawa. Um, so very much so. This will be a, a for. A, it's significant news. So there'll there'll be a lot of people. Um, there'll be a lot of people sad. Oh yeah, there'll be a lot of testimonials. Uh, she, she, she's one of the good ones. Um, so yes, uh, in uh, Trump court, it seems that uh, they've had uh, some of the hearings uh, on whether or not uh, he had violated uh, his conditions, and yes, indeed, he had. He'd been judged to have violated nine times, so it was uh, fined nine thousand dollars. Of course, that means pretty much nothing to him. That's one donation. Uh, from somebody yes, who's really rich really. and then someone who, with a yeah with change to spare uh, and uh, once again he's back at it with his uh, I'll accept the results if it's honest but of course he words, can decide whether or not I want I'll accept yeah. if I don't I, it's, yeah. yes exactly and of course he gets to decide whether or not they're honest and after which saying that the two he he was a uh, robbed out of the 2020 so the guy who despite uh, the fact he had all these court cases and everything going on and audits and audits that even republicans order themselves and all these things determined that uh, no he actually did lose he's still saying uh no i won so here's my judgment about what happened last time and uh it's my judgment that is going to determine whether or not i lost the next <laughs> it's like yeah my, my already proven to be shit judgment is what we're going to rely on to determine whether or not it was fair next time. So, um, we've seen this playbook. He's doing it all over again. So, uh, will the media learn something or, or not? Will the American people learn something or not? Will Republican voters learn something or not? Who knows? We don't know. Uh, 
Justice Marie Jose Hug will be releasing her initial report from the public inquiry in foreign interference today, uh, with a final report being required by the end of the year. Uh, we still don't know anything as Canadian citizens about any investigations that may or may not have been uh, launched into the actual leaks. We're interfere where we're investigating the foreign interference, but we may not be investigating the domestic one that we know of. We don't even know if an investigation has been launched yet. Uh, this fall, Hug uh, will will focus it, uh, testimony uh, on uh, testimony from diaspora communities in more public hearings. So the hearings will continue. Um, the Canada Dental Plan, as we mentioned, started on May 1st. 1.7 million eligible Canadians of age 70 and over have registered. That's uh, They say that the program eventually will cover about one in four Canadians. About 5,000 order health care providers have registered so far, which is fewer than one-fifth of the ones in the country. It seems that... Uh, the registration process was cumbersome and involved a lot of uh, legal terms and conditions that still had yet to be defined. So people would be signing on to stuff that they didn't fully know right. would involve and the amount of paperwork and all that kind of stuff. So someone see, let's see how this flies. It seems the better federal government has listened to people and has simplified the process so that providers can just directly build the plan without registering officially. Uh, with the program, so with, well, that would avoid a lot of paperwork, but that won't be an option prior to July. But still, some people in the dental community says, "Yeah, but even if they use the program to build directly, using it pretty much implies signing all of the documents that if you had fully written in the green, go through all those conditions." So mm, maybe you know, it's like it may be nice that you're making the interface easier, but we still have to read all those terms and know what they are and figure out whether or not it's something we want to take on. Uh, some services requiring pre-authorization like crowns or personal dentures won't start being covered until November. Uh, so it's still more uh, basic procedures like cleanings and stuff like that at the moment. Uh, dental care providers said that they want the plan to cover more preventative services than it does as well. They're pushing for that. Uh, remember, as we mentioned on the show, even though there's a lot of... Uh, politicians describing it as people will get some will get free dental care and some of them will get free dental care it doesn't necessarily mean they're free your provider can charge whatever they want and that goes to it so you know if it's you're getting 150 dollars to something that costs 175 you will still get a 25 dollar bill right so you know that uh but it seems that on the first day of the program 1200 canadians under the plan did receive some kind of service mm. sometime during the nation uh sometime during the day at some point during the nation, at some place during the nation. Sorry, I'm tripping over my tongue. Um, it seems that according to St St Statistics Canada, that the cost of baby formula has increased about 20% between February 2022 and 2024. And it seems that uh, there are some uh, measures that were actually put in the budget to actually help uh, with that. Um, we won't go into them today. I'll save them for another podcast. Uh, but uh, with the budget, it seems, and I didn't know this uh, was I was doing more because I thought I had covered everything, but it seems that the budget uh, also has a little bit of uh, places where they can change certain laws that do have some financial impact but you wouldn't think of them as things that, that wouldn't necessarily be in the budget. But there's about, I think, 66 different laws of different types being uh, changed. Uh, and some of them are actually kind of interesting. So I, I read a list uh, of them uh, when I was doing my research. And uh, I think I'll bring some of them to you because uh, uh, there, there are things that didn't get a lot of play. And there's something uh, called a Ca Canadian Education uh, Bond or something, which is an interesting program that I hadn't heard of, but if I understand correctly, it's this type of thing that if you are low income, you register for, and the federal government automatically throws some money in to help for the pay the education of your child later on. Mm. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people know about it, so I want to find out more I didn't. about it so I can uh, bring it to Yeah, apparently it's been, it's been in existence for a while. So, um, yeah, so I'll find out more about that. So, like I said, when you, when you yeah, sometimes you need to read through the entire document uh, to actually find out what's in there, and there's a lot yes. more in there than you'd, you'd think. Um, but that's in there too. Uh, all right, uh, I think those are all my tidbits that I had just to 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 keep you up to date there. 
Do you have anything, Mr. Grizzly, before we go? Well, uh, we'll just get into the Diane Deans thing. For those of, uh, for the folks who aren't aware, Diane Deans was a city councillor for about 28 years, first elected in 1994. She chaired several high-profile committees, including the Transit Commission, and was the first woman to chair the Ottawa Police Services Board. In June 2022, she announced she was ending her mayoral bid and would not for, run for re-election in Gloucester Southgate. Uh, apparently, and, and this is, I, I, you know, I may have heard the news before, but I don't, I don't recall. Uh, she has had a five-year battle with ovarian cancer. And it, I guess it was, this was a particularly, um, aggressive cancer as, as I understand. So that's, that is sad news. She leaves behind a, a great legacy. Of course, she I didn't agree with a lot of the things she did, but mm -hmm. she was a, an effective counselor who cared about her community. And then I can't argue with any of that. She was, yep. I didn't like yep. all the things she said and did, but you're never going to like everything everybody does anyway. Right. Yep. It's not, it's not, it's not me being argumentative or problematic. It's just, that's just how it is. Again, but yeah, again, a good constituency I, representative. Very much so, you know. Um, from the mayor, uh, Mark Sutcliffe, I was shocked and saddened to learn the news about longtime city councilor and community leader, Diane Deans. Diane is a trailblazer for women in politics is one of the longest serving councilors in Ottawa history. Yeah. So my thoughts are with Diane and her family and her many friends. She was first diagnosed with cancer in 2019. Her battle has been both public and courageous. I, you know what, I, because it goes back five years, that's probably why I didn't, I didn't immediately put two and two together. Mm -hmm. So it did come off as a bit of a surprise to me, but yeah, you know, in the end it's, um, five years, that's, it's a long time. Yeah. Well, oh. and, and now that I think about it, my friend who just lost his life to cancer on Sunday, he, uh, his, he, I think he was six years, mm -hmm. five, five or six years, at least five years. Cause it was pre pandemic when he told us. So yeah. it's at least five years ago. Hmm. Yeah. Um, there were, um, a couple of tidbits that I forgot because I forgot to scroll up because <laughs> um, I put them all on the list, but there's a couple of couple, couple more before we go. Um, for those who are following, uh, the court case, uh, or the adventures of, a uh, Dina Sheriff, it seems that on the day that she had the bail hearing, um, someone patched in some very explicit gay pornography. Oh, really? That appeared for about uh, 30 seconds or so. Um, apparently, uh, this type of thing is very, 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 very illegal to do. And uh, if uh, the person is able to be identified, they will be severe. They will be seriously prosecuted. Uh, the effect of that incident is that the court had been shut down for some substantial period of time on that day. So uh, for anybody who is following the case, uh, if you happen to tune in to uh, the live uh, broadcasted events online, do not patch in gay porn okay. or straight porn. Stunched. Or any porn, or even a cooking show. Just do not patch stuff in. That that that's that's that that will get you in trouble. Okay. <laughs> um, speaking of court, there is some buzz that the International Criminal Court is considering issuing warrants on members of the Netanyahu government, including Netanyahu himself, yeah, uh, for interfering with international humanitarian assistance and failure to exercise due care. Uh, it seems that Hamas would also be named uh, as the right to resist only goes so far. Um, people, when they, uh, they talk about, uh, the UN and stuff, uh, well, the ICC actually does have teeth. Um, the ICJ doesn't, uh, which we're talking about, but it is significant. The ICJ is significant. That's where South Africa brought their, their court case right. because, uh, you know, it, it's the court of, it's more like the court of global opinion, whereas the IC, ICC is actual criminal and can, uh, lay charges and, uh, put down, uh, um, issue rulings that have teeth and consequence. Um, Netanyahu, of course, says he will never accept it. Of course, um, he but uh, he Big did. Shock. Short, but shortly after, then came the news that he would not make a ground invasion of Rafa without first talking to the United States. So, I think he's a little shook. Uh, maybe a little bit. 
because I don't think maybe reality is starting to hit him in the face. Yes. Um, people are often wondering sometimes about the UN, you know, why it is they're not doing anything. And I was listening to Bo, the fifth column, uh, who I listened to a lot. And he said something that I found really interesting. He says, you have to remember that the United States was designed to stop the United States. The United Nations was designed to stop things before they start, Mm -hmm. but not to stop them after they start. It doesn't affect change so much as it maintains status quo. Right. So when you have something that happens in the country and you're situated, like for example, Bosnia, where they were at war, and then they suddenly didn't want to be at war, there was a change in the status quo. They brought the UN in with the peacekeepers to try to maintain the the new status quo. Right. Right. But it's not like the new peacekeepers come in and says, you should really have some peacekeepers now. It's like, no, we're not listening. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) I say, okay, now we're ready for peacekeepers. Okay, now you're ready. So just to... Yeah, when they're talking about like, why can't the UN do something? Exactly not what it was designed for. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's just a little piece of civics that sometimes we forget that we miss, and so we need someone need someone to remind us to remind us of it. Um, in Florida, there is a full six week abortion ban now in effect. Uh, there are uh, exceptions for rape, incest, and human trafficking. But um, that takes away another state in the the south of the United States. Uh, in Arizona, however, they fully repealed the 1864 one uh, that limited it down to six weeks, and now they're back to the uh, uh, they're down to the 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 15 uh, week thing that uh, is still a restriction, but that they put in place somewhere like 2022, like immediately after uh, the reversal of a rev- revocation of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court. And finally, in the United States, the U.S. Federal Reserve voted to hold interest rates steady at its latest meeting, uh, hoped for interest rate cuts during the summer, now seem an impossibility, and analysts are saying that it's now delayed until at least November. Uh, the rates had been a, at, held steady at a quarter of a century high for the last six meetings, just like in Canada, the last six meetings have been high. Uh, but a slew of hotter and unexpected economic data has given no reason to cut rates. The Fed Chair Jerome Powell says that there's been a, quote, lack of further progress on inflation. Now, in Canada, the situation's a little different. Uh, the Fed didn't cut, uh, the, not the Fed, sorry, the, the governors of the Bank of Canada didn't cut the rates here, but it looks a lot like they will happen at the next interest rate meeting. I think that one is scheduled for June 5th. Um, our uh, numbers are better. Uh, if you remember not too long ago, I think it was like about six or seven months ago, the conservatives kept on comparing United States inflation to ours because the rate was better. Uh, While well, the United States inflation rate is now at 3.5 and ours is at 2.9. Mm-hmm. You don't hear uh, Pierre Polyev given the prime minister credit for that. So, so he said. Oh. Um, now, we already have a divergent interest rate. Uh, ours is at five, theirs is at 525. Five. It mm-hmm. seems that analysts are saying that there's nothing wrong with the Bank of Canada's interest rate diverging from the United States and that the Bank of Canada probably has the room for two or three uh, cuts to bring us to about like 0.75 to 1% different from the United States. But we probably wouldn't be able to go that much further away from what the United States is doing than that because uh, the having an interest rate differential puts downward pressure on our dollar and therefore makes things more expensive for us to buy. So they'll have to, to, to balance that as well. Uh, but it seems that uh, this, while the United States is going one way, we might uh, be going uh, the other way on, uh, on interest rates very soon. And that will be another point uh, of demarcation and distinction in the lead up to the next election. Uh, it will be an argument that will be removed from PP that the United States is doing so much better than us. Because mm. they're not. All right. That's the end of all my tidbits. <laughs> Get some cups. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, do we have a show? We do indeed, sir. All we right, my indeed. friends. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we loved making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless and you have the mouths from which we want the word to come. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. It makes us very, 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 very happy when you do. Oh, Michael already out there with the cue of the cot. Uh, that's a little premature. That's a premature enunciation, my friend. <laughs> if you would like to not miss an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the fun, feisty, uh, fashionable, 
the Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code that is uh, underneath my chin, that will bring you to our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver with a hyphen between each one of those words, lowercase letters, please. And uh, that way, would you subscribe to our pod page when we have something fresh off the bandwidth? We will come directly to your inbox. And if you would like to, keep you get PNC bio Douglas excellent understanding of the rate difference limits impressive wow well thank you so much <laughs> I'm being praised for my financial acumen <laughs> um it make like Kit Elaine thank you right on cue have a beyond awesome day everyone and remember to smash the button before you leave and so you can smash that button by going to our true north eager beaver media incorporated YouTube page where like share and subscribe are waiting for you please click them they want you to click them can you not hear them calling your name mm-hmm. click me click me bob linda jesse click me <laughs> all right and if you'd like to support us in other ways uh, the qr code by mr grizzly's head brings you to our coffee page that's coffee ko hyphen fi.com slash eager beaver lowercase letters all in one word and that will bring you to the beaver lodge emergency hydration fund and that is where you can find our good friends caesar guinness hot chocolate and cafe waiting to help us produce this show that you so very much love and appreciate and we thank you for sending us so much love over the past little while we promised that uh, we had some thank yous coming and uh, we do um a big thank you to kit cassie thank you so very Mm much uh stating um still worth getting up early on Manitoba time to watch diversity of viewpoints in the damn fam chat broadens my mind and perspectives love from a now retired farmer. Enjoy your retirement, Cassie. You've worked hard. You deserve it. And thank you for feeding us. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Unless, unless it was a dairy farm, then thank you for giving us milk. <laughs> well, what else do we get from milk? Cheese. Cheese. Oh. We all like cheese, oh, right? I love cheese. Right. Uh, really love thanks cheese. to Kit Wendy, who has sent us a message. Cheers, gents. Much love and respect. Thank you for your much appreciated morning company and insights. And then uh, Kit Carroll uh, sent us a little something too uh, around the end of the month uh, with no message, just a little support over there. And I believe that those were all the ones I had to catch up on. Uh, if I missed you, I am so sorry. Uh, but I believe that those were all the ones I had to catch up on. So thank you so much for your contributions. We we appreciate it very much. Everything goes uh, into uh, the show. Um, you know what? Just in case I missed this one here, uh, just in case, I think I missed more. No, there are two more. Kit Tavi G because I don't remember reading this to my absolute favorite freaks, Douglas knows you are family. Thanks for including me anywhere. We are, you are invited and kit Vim. Thank you, Paul and Douglas, a special mention for Lola with purple lips from blackberries. I am so happy to be part of the Tam fam. <laughs> and now I'm caught up on everyone who helped us. Thank you so very much. Um, we appreciate it. Remember, the gift of your attention is the one that we appreciate the most. But uh, if you are able to help with a couple of dollars, that always does uh, make our day and makes things a little, makes the load a little lighter for us uh, to carry in order to be able to, to bring the show to you. And yes, Kit PNC Bio, that dog is adorable. She is my, my production four assistant. Legs. She's just my production four assistant. Legs. She, she's, she usually just sleeps through the whole show. So she's not the greatest production assistant, but I'll keep her. <laughs> Yeah, but she does lots of work pre and post show. Oh yes, yes, yes. Clean and looking. Such a good girl, hey Lola. Such a good girl. Oh, she's such a sweetie. I can't and wait it, to see you again. And you have had the pleasure of meeting her. So. Oh, oh yeah, it's love. It's love. Oh, yeah. Um. All right. 
So that's all the stuff. Remember, we love to hear from you. So write to us, TrueNorthEagerBeaver at gmail.com. Write us at our Twitter feed at TrueEager. Go to our blog page on Facebook, all the places. We appreciate it very much. Uh, when you write to us, we read everything, even though we don't necessarily get to respond to everything. Um, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please uh, some stars, some reviews. We really appreciate that because democracy is something that you do. Do write those letters. If you're in Alberta, do get involved in the NDP leadership race. Um, it's very important. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your Beaver saying, it can be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom to take us into the weekend. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Friday. It's a beautiful spring day in the nation's capital. I don't know what the weather's like where you are, but it is nice and sunny here right now, and it's supposed to go up to 21, I think. I believe it's going to 21. I could be incorrect about that one. Let me just see. It says right now it's 13 and mostly cloudy, but the, I don't see a lot of clouds out there. Let me just check the old uh, the old weather cam here because I, I have a weather cam, right? Let's go see. That's not the weather cam. Where's the weather cam? There's the weather cam. And, uh, well, it's, it seems to be very bright out right now. That, that is very <laughs> bright. Wow. Well, I have, to adjust, uh, I have to adjust the setting. So it, what happens is it, even though it's supposed to do its thing, it doesn't always do it for some reason. That reminded uh, me of the days I was a teenager and I had braces and I smiled into the sun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. It's just, oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. I'll just turn the game down. Yeah. That. There. yeah. Okay. Here. Now I can add it in. Now it looks, this looks a little bit better. Let's go with, uh, yeah, we'll go with a quad. We'll go with a quad. Boom. There we go. We got the puppy dog. We got the outdoor. Although the, the camera's reversed. Why did it reverse? It's not supposed to reverse. I know. Uh, hang on a second here. It, I don't know. It automatically wants to mirror. That's okay. But anyway. I hate it when it does that, though. It's like, I don't want to mirror. I want to see things the way they are. Uh, not the way the camera wants. Well, you know, some, anyway. Yeah, so you can see it's uh, there is some clouds, but it's going to be a beautiful day. Yep. It's going to be a beautiful day. And that house you see in the in the foreground on the right, that's the Ukrainian ambassador's residence. Well, there you go. Slava Ukraini. Indeed. Yes. All right, kids and cubs. Mr. Grizzly, please. Cue the cock. I now it's time, Kit Mike. Yet, oh, you didn't do them yet. Okay. I, I don't think I did, did I? No, I don't. No, you didn't. You just showed us the weather cam. You're right. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because it's going to, yeah, and then I was leading somewhere because it's going to be a nice, beautiful, warm spring day out there today, as we just looked at. And I don't know what the high is supposed to be today, but I think it's going to 21 in Canada's capital. So what I was going to say was if you have a chance to get, uh, 19 is the high expected high here. If you have a chance to get outside today and spend some time in the sunshine, maybe go for a walk, maybe sit in the park and do some reading, read a book, do, some, do a little bit of work outside if you can. I intend to, no, don't steal my sandwich. I intend to do a little bit of work this afternoon outside in the park uh, as, as my day winds down. I'm going to take my laptop and my phone, sit outside in the park and do a little bit of work to, to wind up my, my uh, work day because I have the ability to do that. So yeah, why not do should. it, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you have a chance to get outside today and enjoy the beautiful weather, provided the weather is beautiful where you are, it is in, in Canada's capital. I don't know about where it is in the rest of the country, but by all means, go out, enjoy this beautiful, sunshiny, warm weather because it doesn't stick around forever. And our summer is so much shorter than we think. Get out of my food. She keeps trying to sneak my sandwich. I haven't, I haven't finished eating that yet, Lola. Oh my God. She's staring at me. She's staring right through me. Like that's food. And I want it. That's food. And I say, <laughs> All righty. All right. Let's do the thing. Now. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and the Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music.
the kids are being naughty. They're making sex jokes. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> well, yes. Michael, good Michael. Okay, one last time. Cue the cock. And then you got Kit Saucy go, finally, the climax. <laughs> so I have a feeling that Kit Michael must be having a post podcast Siggy because he had to cue the cock three times before he got to. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> these things do happen sometimes never happen to me but you know we be cheeky <laughs> have a beaver with a quick and everyone i'll see you <laughs>